All right. We are live for the much anticipated debate between myself and Gavin Hurleyman. So that being said, we have Praise I Am who is going to be moderating the debate this evening. So I am going to hand it over to Praise for the introductions and uh, the introducing of the format. So Praise, thanks so much for moderating this debate and the floor is yours. Awesome. Looking forward to this. Awesome. It'll be a great discussion. Uh, so here's the format tonight for this debate. 17 minute opening statements. We got 15 minute rebuttals, 30 minute discussions after that, or 30 minute discussion after that. And then we'll have a cordially equally timed six minute closings. And then we'll have a 20 minute Q and A. And let's get ready to rumble. Tonight is the big night. We have two seasoned debaters discussing the topic of eternal security and conditional security which is, which one is biblical in the right corner we have standing six foot two 217 pounds former wrestler standing for truth taking the eternal security side and in the left corner we have gavin hurlman standing at five foot ten 225 pounds, former <laughs> kickboxer, taking the conditional security side. Looking forward to it. Praise. You You deserve a raise for that one. So very, very impressive. <laughs> uh, you <laughs> Better than the WWF days. Uh, Gavin, yeah, I see you noticed you had a glare there as well. So it looks like um, he's... Uh, just fixing that up. It's, it's a sunny day over there in uh, New Zealand. So uh, we appreciate that, Gavin. And that way we're not just staring right into the sun. <laughs> oh, that looks good. That looks good. Is my audio coming in okay, Praise? Absolutely great. Great. It, it sounds great. And also, Gavin, go ahead, go ahead and speak, Gavin, because you're on mute just to make sure that your audio. Uh, there we go. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. 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 Uh, maybe we can do so. Praise. Thanks for the introduction. Maybe hand it over to Gavin for just a, a brief introduction into who he is. Um, and I'll do the same real quick and then we'll just get right into the opening statements. Go ahead, Gavin. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name's is Gavin. Um, I just want to say hi to everybody in the chat, especially uh, May May Ortega from the Philippines who's got four people sitting at her kitchen table listening to the one iPhone. Now, that is commitment, I think. So um, I don't have a channel. I'm not that famous yet, but I'm working on it. But I'm battling Sunstrike at the moment. But I'm really pleased to be here, and this should be fun. Awesome. Well, thank you, Gavin. Um, everybody knows who I am. This is my channel, Standing for Truth. I host debates, discussions, and interviews. Praise, looks like you got the light, the, the light shining right from heaven. So, um, but uh, I, I'm excited to debate this topic. I've had between 80 and 100, I've kind of lost count, uh, formal, informal debates. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. I've written numerous books, many of them back there, mostly on creation evolution, but I do also love the topic of soteriology. So my two favorite things to debunk are evolution ponds come to people evolution and conditional security so i'm ready to go and i think this is going to be a lot of fun we got a great chat already praise i know we're having an audience q a as you pointed out in the intro so therefore to the uh to the audience please <laughs> tag uh praise with your with your uh, questions <laughs> Someone in the commenter says, Gavin is anointed in my God. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting raptured. Yeah, uh, I, I guess the preacher of rapture was true after all. So uh, steadfast and easy, $5 super chat. Thank you so much. Good evening, gents. God bless one and all. God bless you as well. Good vibes from Patrick. And uh, <laughs> so... Go ahead, Praise. You're the moderator. You, you, you got to direct us. Yes. So we're going to start with Gavin. He's going to start us off tonight with a 17-minute opening. I'm going to actually uh, do his PowerPoint. So, Gavin, just give me the cues, and we'll get this party started. It should be a good one. 
Um, but also, yeah, so if there's any any questions, please tag me. Do not tag uh, SFT because he's actually a contestant. So um, give me one second here. Give me one, and then I will pull her up. So, Gavin, are you ready to go, buddy? Or Yeah, I'm ready to rock and roll. Apologies to the viewers. We're, we're just going to have to deal with the sun strike because there's not much I can do about it. All right. So let me pull her up here. And um, on your first word, Gavin, we will get started. I'll start the timer. Give me one second, though, actually. I'm going to get my timer up. Can I just say a quick prayer prize before we kick off? Absolutely. Go ahead, man. Yeah, Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for Donnie. Thank you for praise. Thank you. I'm not sure if Neff's around, but <laughs> if he's here, thank you for Neff. And uh, above all, God, we just pray that uh, you and your name is going to be glorified as a result of this debate between two Christian brothers. Um, we ask, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And, and actually, before you start, Gavin, we did have someone in the chat recommend. Um, it, it's it, Typically, it's better to resolve these before we get going. Do you have like a pillow or a blanket that you can put <laughs> over the window? Um, someone was... <laughs> yeah, I have. I've done that already. I've, I've done everything okay. that I can possibly do. Okay. Okay. No, that, that's so fine. We, we just have to deal with it. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. There is cloud. There is cloud in the sky, so I'm hoping for a cloud cover soon. Okay, no problem. Go ahead. It's all set up, Gav. Are you ready to rock and roll? Just let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll do the cues for you. Yeah, okay. So do you want to um, do the first slide, please, brother? Okay, so today I'm going to be um, doing a critique on eternal security and uh, free grace theology. So, and I'm going to I'm going to use the 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 phrase ET for eternal security because it's just easier to say. Um, so ET and free grace theology is based on a misunderstanding of the word alone in the historic Protestant affirmation of justification by faith alone. Can we have the next slide, brother? There we go. Um, and there's also uh, a mis... Well, I'm not sure if it's a misunderstanding, but it's certainly a, 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 a lack of emphasis on repentance. But anyway, we'll come to that later. So first of all, let's... Let's hit on uh, the phrase, uh, sola fide, faith alone. The consistent Protestant teaching from the Reformation on, onwards has never been, never taken faith alone to mean faith that occurs by itself in a person unaccompanied by other human activities. The Reformers always took faith alone, in air quotes, to mean that faith is the only thing that God responds to. And so the Reformation teaching was, we are justified by faith alone, with a big underline under the word alone. It is alone what God requires. But the faith that justifies is never alone, never alone, because repentance and good works are an inevitable part of sola fide. Um, next slide, please, please, brother. Yeah, so... This is why the antinomian movement in the 1700s was kind of looked down upon and, and, and kind of scorned. So you can see that um, free grace and eternal security, this is nothing new. It's been around uh, since the, the days of the Reformation. Um, in the 17th century, it was called the antinomian controversy, um, which, was, which was basically uh, around lawlessness. And in the 20th century, it's called the Lordship Salvation Controversy. And even today, even today in the 21st century, we still have this, this free grace slash eternal security controversy going on. Um, I'm not going to read all of that, but there's, there's a lot there. Um, but uh, just I've just highlighted something in, in red right at the bottom that, that's worth considering. Now, this is from... This is from Zane C. Hodges, who was a founder of the, of the Free Grace uh, Theology in the U.S., and he wrote, there are, a growing number of our, oh, there are a growing number in our camp who no longer believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. And then he goes on to write, but these are essential as part of the saving gospel that is necessary to believe for eternal salvation. And then there's some more quotes from um, Hodges and also from Robert Wilkin, which uh, 
Donnie had on the show just recently. So, can we have the next slide, brother? Please. All right. Um, <clears throat> so this, so Solo Fide or Faith Alone. This is the repeated teaching of the great Reformation teachers and confessions, and of the entire sweep of mainstream mainstream evangelical Protestant of the Protestant movement. Um, next slide, please, brother. And here's here's some of the famous confessions. Uh, Formula of Concord, Articles of Church of England, Westminster Confession of Faith, um, the same wording for the Philadelphia Baptist Confession from the Westminster Confession was used, and there's the New Hampshire Baptist Confession, um, which I've plucked a quote out of because it's just really good. It says, regeneration is affected by the power of the Holy Spirit. Its proper evidence appears in the holy fruits of repentance and faith and newness of life. That is awesome. So <clears throat> here's a question for the eternal security and free grace camp. Where in the entire history of the mainstream evangelical Protestant movement do you ever find the idea that justi justification by faith alone means faith that is not accompanied by repentance or good works? Um, the problem for the free graces and the ETs is that you won't find that in the New Testament in the Bible. Faith alone has never meant faith not accompanied by other human actions. Rather, faith alone means faith is the only thing that God responds to with the act of justification. Faith and nothing else is what God counts as a legitimate means of obtaining justification. But... Faith is not alone, means it is accompanied by other things, even though God does not count those other things as any part of the means of obtaining justification, as it is accompanied by other things because, because God, the God of the Bible, connects them together as he does in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 to 30. So therefore, the ET and free grace movement today is not, is not, upholding the Reformation doctrine of sola fide or justification by faith alone. What it is doing is promoting a view of saving faith that the Reformers never held. The Reformers were striving to separate faith from works done to merit salvation, such as particip participation in the sacraments, faith plus being baptised, faith plus attending Mass, faith plus doing penance, all actions, all works to earn merit with God. The reformers were not, were not trying to separate faith from genuine repentance from sin. And they were not, they were not saying that genuine faith could occur without a change in someone's life. Perhaps the attractiveness um, of the ET free grace movement today is that at first it sort of sounds to people like it's promoting a reformation doctrine. But what it is promoting is a doctrine that the leaders of the Reformation would have had nothing to do with. And we should not think that it has its roots in the Reformation movement. So where does the New Testament ever say that faith can occur by itself in a person who is saved without repentance from sin and without good works following? Question mark. The answer is nowhere. Notice the Apostle Paul does not say you were justified and nothing else necessarily happened when you believed. But then Paul goes on to say, just a minute, just a minute, praise. I'll put it on pause just in case something's going on there. Yeah. Okay, can you restart it? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay, so Paul goes on to say after after listing a long list of transgressions, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You'll see that in First Corinthians chapter six, verse eleven. So, um, et and free grace theology weakens the gospel message, and now moving on to the lack of emphasis and attention paid to repentance. So now 
the ET and free grace theology weakens the gospel message by avoiding any call to believers to repent of their sins. Now, that might be a bit harsh, so perhaps I might modify that by saying there's certainly a lack of emph emph emphasis in the ET and free grace movement on repentance of sins. The call to repentance is frequent in the gospel summaries. All we have to do is look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, where the author um, writes, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine, let us leave the elementary doctrine, in other words, let us leave the Sunday school um, Bible study doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So repentance, repentance is not just a change of some mental ideas and what you think about God. Um, <clears throat> Paul did not say, the Apostle Paul did not say that he testified to Jews and Greeks about a change of opinion about some intellectual facts about God. Rather, Paul states it is repentance toward God that involves coming into the presence of the one omnipotent and infinitely holy God and crying out to him as Isaiah did in uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to um, uh, read that out. But, shock horror, it's also affirmed by Christ our Saviour in his encounters with unbelievers. You can see this with the rich young ruler in Luke 18. Um, you can see this with the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, and also Zacchaeus, the tax collector, in Luke chapter 19. However, now here's a problem for the ET and free, free grace camp. Um, they have two differing definitions of repentance. First of all, they have um, a definition for repentance, which they call a change of mind, necessary before saving faith, but includes no resolve to turn from sin. And um, I know Donnie's got this book. This is Charles Bing's book, Lordship Salvation. The other definition they have is from David R. Anderson in his book, Free Grace Soteriology, um, and it's described as an repentance is described as an internal resolve to turn from one's sin, but not necessarily, or sorry, but not necessary before saving faith, but is desirable afterwards. Of the page, of the page, of the page. In fact, Charles Bing, in his book, Lordship Salvation, says that the basic meaning of the Greek word metanoia is to change the mind. And he gives a footnote um, to the BDAG lexicon as his proof. Uh, for the Greeks, Bing says metanoia never suggests an alteration in the total moral attitude of oneself or a, or a profound change in one's life direction or a conversion which affects the whole conduct of a person. Um, <laughs> but Charles Bing is just simply wrong, because it seems Bing is not playing fair with his readers in this quotation. What he fails to mention is that the BDAG lexicon does not put any New Testament passages in this first category, and the first category is to change one's mind. Rather, the same lexicon that Bing is quoting from puts every New Testament entry under meaning number two, which is feel remorse, repent, be converted, and for the noun metanoia, primarily a change of mind, also with the nuance of remorse as regret for shortcomings and errors, as our literature with focus on the need of change in view of responsibility to deity, repentance, turning about, and conversion. All right, over the page. The English translations of the word repent are not change of mind or change your mind. When the authors um, or theologians that support uh, eternal security or free grace define re repentance as a change of mind, they are differing not only with the standard New Testament Greek, le Greek lexicon, but also with all of the English Bible translations. No English Bible translation translates metanoia as change one's mind or even change, one heart, even change one's heart. Um, they all translate metanoia 
with the word repent, and for good reason. The English word repent does not mean merely change your mind, but in the religious sense, the word repent means the following three things. Number one, to feel remorse, contrition, or self-reproach for what one has failed, what one has done or failed to do, be contrite. Number two, to feel such regret for past conduct. Um, ah, praise, can you um, zip through a few slides, please? Sorry about that, brother. Yeah, next one. Don't be to perish. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So that, just, just keep it on that one, brother. Uh, and number three, to make a change for the better as a result of remorse or contrition for one's sins. This is why all the verses in the New Testament that include the word repent with an exclamation mark at the end of it as part of the gospel message argue against the eternal security and free grace position. All those translation committees made up of experts in the languages of Hebrew and Greek have decided not not to translate metanoia as merely change your mind, but they translate it as repent. All right, next slide, please, brother. Uh, yeah, we've kind of gone past that. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, lexicon, standard Greek dictionary for New Testament, BDAG does not agree that repentance merely means a change of mind. In the New Testament, it does not list change of mind as the only meaning of the Greek word metanoia. That is true. Uh, next slide, brother, please. False assurance. All right, now we're cooking. Okay, so coming to the uh, in uh, closing closing seconds of the first round, um, E.T. and free grace theology weakens the gospel message by avoiding or minimizing any call to repent of one's sins. Um, E.T. and free grace theology also gives false assurance of eternal life to many people who profess faith in Christ but then show no evidence of said faith in their pattern of life. This weakening of the gospel message of E.T., and free grace theology is a, is a major concern because it lacks any call to seriously repent from sins, which will result and has resulted in many people who are actually unsaved when they think they are saved. Uh, next slide, please, praise. Okay. Now, the New Testament epistles frequently show that regular churchgoers should be warned from time to time that they may not be saved or might not be saved. So even in the first century in the early church, the congregation was told, um, just, just be aware, you know, just be aware that you're, you're living you know, righteously. Because Paul um, wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter One 6, he wrote, yeah, well, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Next slide, last slide, please. And I'll finish with two quotes from very well-known theologians. Um, Harry Jessup, who's no longer with us, unfortunately, he succinctly states that, that he succinctly states the conditional salvation position as salvation, while in its initial stages made real in the soul through an act of faith, is maintained within the soul by a life of faith manifested in lifelong faithfulness. And Bill Mounts, who's a scholar of New Testament Greek, he writes, while I celebrate the finished work of Christ at the cross, there is a very real sense in which my salvation is an ongoing process, culminating in glorification. And with that, I yield to my learned opponent. Oh, right on time. 17 minutes flat. Way to go. Great job. Um, we're going to hand it over to, to SFT now. We're going to give him the same amount of time. Just let me unshare here really quick. How much time? It looked like that was a little bit more than 17 minutes. How, how much was that well, exactly? It was seven. Well, it's why well, I, I took, I had to take three seconds off because of the his light thing. He, we put it on pause. So no it was a little bit longer because of his light thing, but okay. it was to me 1703. But, All right, uh, perfect, perfect.
And okay, just one second. Let me get my timer ready as well. Yeah, take I'm your time. We'll give, we'll give you some extra time, SFT, if you need it as well. I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't have a problem with SFT taking um, a bit more time. Absolutely. Okay, just let me know when you can see my slides here. Uh, the, yeah, we see it, right? Yeah, it's up. Okay. So just one second. And start my timer here. Okay, why don't we start this debate now and... Uh, a lot of things to say in terms of his opening, but I'll save that for my rebuttal. Now, let us define what we mean by eternal security. Then I want to have a look at the word eternal. Okay, so eternal security is the biblical teaching that once a person receives everlasting life, he is secure forever. That is, once a person is saved, he remains saved everlastingly. For that reason, another expression for eternal security is once saved, always saved. And I saw no argument against eternal security in Gavin's opening statement, so the rebuttal should be fun. Now let us define uh, a, a few important definitions that the work salvationists and conditionalists oftentimes get wrong. Justification, a legal and forensic declaration that one is deemed righteous by faith. Regeneration, the act which results in the state of one being born again. Sanctification, the immediate setting aside of one unto holy purposes, which results in an ongoing process of the removal of personal sin through conforming one to the image of Christ. Glorification, also called future sanctification. This is when we gain glorified bodies. We will never sin anymore. Our bodies will be perfect and they will never decay. The salvation that we have as believers will open to the full experience of Christ. Now, the Bible in 1 John 5, 13 says that ye may know that ye have eternal life. I want everybody to pay, pay close attention to that saying. He did not say that we had eternal life past tense, which would indicate we had eternal life and then lost it. He also did not say we will get eternal life at some point. Uh, praise, can you just make sure you guys are mute, muted just so I don't hear any back, background noise? As in maybe when we get to heaven, we will find out whether we have it or not. No, we are told plainly that we can know that we have eternal life. The word eternal alone demolishes conditional security. Eternal means what? It means never ending. The word eternal has a synonym in the Bible, everlasting. The Bible says we have been passed from death unto life. And so if I have life today, life that never ends, but at some point down the road, I lose it, was it ever really eternal? Of course not. If I have eternal life today, that means it can never end. By definition, that is literally what eternal life means. The conditionalists such as Gavin here butcher this and force eternal to mean something that can end. Notice this slide here. We are reassured in 1 John 5, 13 that we can know that we have eternal life. Does this verse say that we can think we have eternal life? No, the Bible says we can know. We have eternal life. Also, J John 10, 28. Does John 10, 28 say, and I give unto them temporary life? No. Jesus said we have eternal life. Eternal means forever. If I have eternal life today, but then lose it in a year or two, it was never really eternal. So clearly, the Bible tells us that if we are saved, we are always saved. In John 6, 37, God tells us, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. When we believe on the Lord Jesus, we are justified and regenerated. We have been passed from death unto life. You cannot now go from life back to death. God does not commit spiritual abortion. Remember in John 5, 24, here in the slide, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Present tense. To say you can have everlasting life today and not tomorrow is completely illogical and limits the infinite God that we worship. God knows everything. God knows the end from the beginning. According to Gavin here, God knows you are going to lose it and yet still calls it everlasting. The conditional security position, as you can see, is illogical and indefensible. Okay, you can see here all within this one verse, we have present tense, everlasting life, shall not come, 
which is future tense, into condemnation, but is past, past tense, from death unto life. It is the present possession of the believer. Okay, so I want you guys to consider John 3, 18. The Bible reads, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Notice the past tense. He hath not believed. We have two types of people in this world. Those that have believed and those that have not believed. Those that have not believed did not once believe and now no longer believe. No, they hath not believed. The Bible tells us clearly over and over again that once we have believed, we have been passed from death unto life. We are the sons of God. We have been justified, regenerated, and predestined for glorification. We have been sealed with the Holy Ghost. If we could go from regeneration back to unregeneration, this verse and all the other verses I have quoted would make zero sense. John 3, 18 gives us two categories. Those that believe and those that have not believed. If Gavin is right and we could somehow go from a state of regeneration to unregeneration, we would have a person who was once regenerated. And then at some point in his life, he stopped believing and went back into a state of unregeneration. Well, this person would not fit into any of these categories. This hypothetical person neither believes, but you could not actually say he hath not believed because according to the conditionalist, he did believe. Again, conditional security is indefensible and ignores the entirety of scripture. Now, we could spend all day going over the massive number of verses pointing out that, that we'll never hunger, never thirst. Okay. He will not pluck us. No man can pluck us out of the father's hand, but I want to move on to this because it's very important to point out that those that believe they can lose their salvation do not understand some important distinctions. Dr. David Anderson in the book, Free Grace Soteriology sums it up nicely. Almost all objections raised against the doctrine of eternal security can be traced to a failure to distinguish between relationship truth and fellowship truth, or between the requirements for salvation and the requirements for discipleship, or between God's eternal judgment and his temporal judgment, or between literal language and figurative language. When we understand these distinctions, the objections melt away. Understanding those distinctions would actually negate Gavin's entire opening statement where we have repentance from sins as an aspect of discipleship, while repentance in terms of salvation is something totally different, which we will get into a little bit later. So work salvation has failed to differentiate between salvation and the many aspects of our spiritual education, discipleship, fellowship, obedience, daily repentance, and so on. So let us have a look at some verses about salvation and then some verses about discipleship. Notice salvation is easy. Jesus did all the work. Okay, this question is asked in the Bible just to spell it out for us and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe and turn from all your sins. No, it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Romans 4, 5, but to him that worketh a little, no, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Discipleship, on the other hand, where these conditionalists want to just mix all of these aspects up and create some sort of works variant gospel. Discipleship takes work and ongoing service. As you can see here in these, in these passages, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. This has to do with discipleship, not salvation. Here's a great quote. There is a vast difference between coming to Jesus for salvation and coming after Jesus for service. Coming to Jesus makes one a believer, while coming after Christ makes one a disciple. All believers are not disciples. To become a believer, one accepts the invitation of the gospel to believe on the Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. We just saw that in the previous slide. And tons of great stuff on uh, these important distinctions. Okay. For example, discipleship. We're looking at sanctification. Okay. Our commitment to Christ, eternal rewards, continued growth with many conditions. Well, salvation is one condition. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation has to do with justification. It's through faith. It's free. We need to make these important distinctions. Another argument you'll constantly hear too is, well, 
free grace results in a license to sin. They're giving a license to sin. Well, not when you understand what can actually be lost. Salvation cannot be lost, but many things can be lost. And we will get into that a little bit later as well in the, in the debate. So that being said, I want to take this moment to point out this verse that tells us now are we the sons of God. It does not say, and we hear this all the time from the conditionalists, that in the future or at final salvation or from God's perspective, you know, we will eventually find out if we are the sons of God. No, we are now the sons of God and there's no way to get around this. That is because eternal life is the believer's present possession. Now, another important distinction to understand is the doctrine of the old man versus the new man. The part of us that is born of God is the spirit and not the flesh. We still have our flesh. Our flesh is unregenerate. When the Bible says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. This is not talking about our old man or our unregenerate flesh, and the conditionalists don't seem to understand this. This is talking about our new man, the spirit. The old man has not been done away with clearly. And this teaching is incredibly consistent throughout Scripture. The Apostle Paul was clear. We are to put off the old man and put on the new man. We are to die daily and put on the new man. This does not come automatic. It is a daily battle and a daily struggle. Okay, what do we see here? Well, we see a dichotomy. One who sins and one who does not sin. We see this laid out in Romans 7. Paul makes a clear distinction between his body or flesh and his spirit or his inward man. Understanding this concept is incredibly important to have an accurate view of salvation, and especially to understand the book of 1 John. As we have learned, the spirit is that which has been born of God. The flesh is not. The flesh sins and the spirit doth not sin. As believers, we have the flesh and the spirit, the old man and the new man, the outward man and the inward man. Okay. Again, what is born of God? Is it the flesh or is it the spirit? Anybody listening should now be answering the spirit, of course. The spirit is regenerated and the spirit doth not commit sin. The spirit cannot sin because it is born of God. As believers, we have been passed from death unto life. The life we have been given is the new creature. All things have become new. Not some things, all things. That's the new man. I didn't get a new house. I didn't get a new body. It's the new man. Anybody who understands this will also understand that we cannot lose the new man. God would never commit spiritual abortion against the new man. How could we lose the new man who cannot even sin? He is a new creation. When we read 1 John, we must rightly divide the word of truth. When we read each passage, we must ask ourselves, are we now talking about the old man or the new man? Are we referring to the old man who is capable of sin, or are we referring to the spirit, which is regenerated and cannot sin? Paul says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Notice, it is the flesh that abides in death. We are told to die daily, and one day our old man will die for good. When our flesh dies, our new man goes to heaven. It is our new man that inherits the kingdom of God. And this is also how we can know there will be no sin in heaven, because the new man has no sin. And he is who inherits the kingdom of God. If my flesh inherited the kingdom of God, he would just stink up the place. Gavin will ask many questions tonight. What about him that falls away? Yes, and to him that may fall away, he will go as in the flesh will die. What about him that still sins? Or he that fails in discipleship or fails to bring forth much fruit. Remember, though he die, yet shall he live. The flesh will one day die for good. The new man doth not sin does not fall away and the new man does not fail. Get it yet? I hope so. Now, some people have tried to say that the doth not sin should mean does not habitually sin. This makes me laugh every time I hear it. This interpretation fails for so many reasons, but to simply put it to death for good, nice and quickly, I will point out that there exists two underlying Greek words, pueo and prazo. Now the word prazo can mean habitually sin or continue in sin or simply make a practice of something, right? Practice, prazo. There is also another word, pueo, which literally means to commit one single act. Not habitually, not continual sin, not a practice, okay? SFT, practitioner of sin, it's ridiculous. But one single act. Well, if what I am saying is true and it is the old man that commits sin and the new man who cannot sin, 
then the underlying word here should be what? It should be pueo. And lo and behold, what we see is the word pueo and not prazo. The new man cannot sin. Why? Because he is born of God and in him there is no sin. Therefore, he, the new man, cannot be condemned. To say you can lose your salvation is to condemn the spirit that is born of God. From a positional standpoint, God sees the new man, the new birth. The law cannot touch the new man. Remember, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Jesus said, ye must be born again, born of the spirit. This doctrine is found all throughout scripture, and yet so many people do not understand it. If you are here today and you are saved, God did not change your physical birth. No, he gave you something new. Without Christ, there would be no means of regeneration. His sacrifice made salvation possible. When you understand what Christ has done for us and you understand that without him and without his finished work on the cross, the new birth would not be possible. You would then realize that true regeneration cannot be lost. One day when Christ appears in the clouds, the Bible says that we will be made like him. We will finally receive our regenerated bodies. No more pain, no more suffering, no more aging, no more sin. To go to heaven, we must be perfect and righteous. But only God is perfect and righteous. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came into this world. The law could not touch him. He was without sin. He took all our sins on himself and died in our place. Our Savior rose from the dead, and all he has asked us to do, to be with him in heaven, is to believe on him for what he has done for us. In my last minute here, I want to go over a couple verses here that just destroy conditional security. Psalm 89. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Also, there exists, One false, there exists false converts, false professors, okay? First John 2, 19, they went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of, of us. These people were not regenerated. There's no example of somebody who's truly regenerated, justified, predestined for glorification, going from regeneration to unregeneration. We must have a sophisticated view of soteriology and not just automatically assume that some atheist like Matt Dillahunty, who may have at best had a head knowledge or been dragged to church by his parents, was actually regenerated and given the new man no. No, this is not possible, and yet there has not been any evidence provided by Gavin against eternal security, and I yield. Thanks so much. Awesome, SFT. You're actually under time. Great opening as well. Both of you guys had a great opening. We'll now transition into the 15-minute uh, rebuttal period. Um, so I'll give you guys like a one-minute warning, just like I did the, with the set with your opening. So, Gavin, are yeah. you ready to go, buddy? Yeah, can I can I just um, just to make sure I got everything right? Can I steal? Can I try and steal, man? Your your argument, uh, Donny. If you want to make that part of his rebuttal, yeah. So well, it, it, it's your fifteen minute rebuttal, Gavin. So you can do whatever you like with it. Okay, okay, that's fine. So On your first word, go ahead. Yeah, sure, sure. So I'm just going to try and steal, man. I've I've written notes furiously. Man, there's enough straw men there to, to start a bonfire. Um, Donnie was uh, talking about spiritual abortion. Um, seems to be the buzzword for the 20th century. You won't find that phrase anywhere in the in the Bible. Also, um, I, I made a point here. Um, uh, you talked about the word believeth, I think. Believeth, believeth means present and future tense. Um, you also quoted John 3.18. Um, those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This, And I'll just carry on for context. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. So am I allowed to ask questions, Praise? Uh, well, this is be a rebuttal. I Probably you're open. You're, and oh, okay. You're okay. Talking. All right. Okay. So I'm still steel manning here. 
so I, th I think it's I think it's important that I make an appeal here for a holistic reading, a holistic reading, a holistic reading of the scripture instead of plucking verses out. Um, it seemed Donnie was also making a, an appeal about we cannot go from regeneration to un, unregeneration. That's actually false. Um, also, uh, by way of still manning, uh, Donnie said conditional security is indefensible. Well, <laughs> what do you think I'm doing here con contesting it? It's highly defensible. defensible. Now, I did notice that you used um, David R. Anderson as, as a resource. That's, I mean, he's a, he's a free gracer, so that wasn't probably the most neutral of people to, to use as a resource. Um, Donnie talked about discipleship. Um, uh, and also talked about that. I uh, did hear you say salvation is just one condition. That's really weird. Um, there's many things that go um, into salvation, but salvation is a holistic umbrella, right? It's a holistic umbrella. The word salvation is a holistic umbrella that covers all the terms that are synony synonymous with salvation. And there's many terms, and they, these have become buzzwords of the free graces and eternal securists. Um, uh, also, Donnie, I'm pretty sure I heard you talk about something along the lines of uh, the conditional securists, secure, the conditional salvationists will talk about free grace as a license to sin. Again, a straw man, I never mentioned that. Um, you talked about the old man versus the new man. It's a daily battle and a daily struggle. Well, yeah, you'll get no argument from me regarding the daily struggle. Um, again, you mentioned spiritual abortion. Um, and you, my last note that I'll make here, that I'll just address here is those who were once in the faith that are now not in the faith were never regenerated in the first place. Well, there's there's an embarrassing number of scriptural verses that will show that that is not actually correct. Um, so, how much how much more time have I got, Prose? You have briefly around eleven minutes. Really, left. Take your time. Is that what I got left? Wow. Okay. So, okay, so let's let's just focus on on one thing at a time. Um, so, so my um, learned opponent is claiming that those who were once in the faith, that those who were once in the faith that are now not in the faith, were never regenerated in the first place. That's actually false, um, because how would you contend? with the likes of Lucifer, for example. Ezekiel 28, verses 14, 15, Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14, and Revelation 20, verse 10. How would you deal with um, the likes of Judas, for example? Matthew 10, 5 to 7. Satan only entered Judas after he'd taken the morsel. And Judas was out uh, performing miracles with all the other dudes uh, in Matthew. Also, how would you how would you deal with someone like Cain um, when you say uh, people that fell from faith were never never regenerated in the first place? You know, Cain Cain in Genesis four chapter four verse seven. Cain had a choice. God gave him a choice, but Cain, Cain made the wrong decision and suffered. Um, also, uh, a couple of mentions uh, from Paul. He talks about Hymenius and Philitus. Yeah, Philitus in 2 Timothy 2.17. Uh, just for context, I'll read the verses around it. But avoid wor worldly and empty chatter, 
for it will lead to further ungodliness and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenius and Philetus who have, who have gone astray from the truth, claiming that the resurrection has already taken place, dot, dot, dot. So you can fill in the rest of the verse there. And also Paul in his first letter to Timothy um, in chapter 1, verse 20, he writes, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenius, that dude again, and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so they will be taught not to blaspheme. Um, so I'm just I'm just wondering how how my uh, learned opponent is going to deal with the 78 scripture verses that talk about salvation being con conditional. And I'm not going to focus on all 78, but I am going to focus on the uh, conditional salvation biblical passages that are spoken by Christ our Saviour. And I'm looking forward to, to seeing how, how my friend is going to, uh, get around those because if they're coming from the mouth of Christ and they're conditional regarding salvation, then uh, that's it's going to be a hard ask, a hard ask. How much more time, pros? Seven minutes. All right. I'm going to have to wind the clock down. Oh, my goodness. All right. So now is where I Well, do what we said was 10 to 15 minutes, Gavin, so don't feel obligated to yeah. – you can use okay. it all or you don't have. It's up to you. No, that's fine. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll all end right. there. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine, pros. I'll end there. I'll end there, guys. Okay. Well, we can add that into the open discussion or whatever. So, SFT, if you want to uh, do your rebuttal, the, the floor is yours. Whenever you're ready to start, I'll start the timer. Yeah, give me one second. I just want to – Sure. Get my timer going, <clears throat> get my notes going as well that I wrote down. Okay. My audio is coming in good? Yeah. Okay. So let me start my timer now, 15 minutes. Well, I got to say that was a disappointing opening statement, not much defense of his con conditional security position. This should be a lot of fun. Gavin must meet his burden of proof for tonight's debate, and so far he has not presented – really much pertaining to his position of conditional security. Um, and also in the rebuttal addressed almost nothing. Um, I just want to point that out. Now, Gavin seems to be saying that we reject the fact that we must recognize our need for a savior, admit we are a, a, a sinner and turn to Christ for salvation. Does he add more to the gospel than this? I certainly hope not. Now, Gavin says there is a lack of repentance in free grace theology, which is just not true. Firstly, free grace simply defines repentance accurately. When it comes to repenting of our sins, for example, we recognize this is an aspect of what? Our discipleship. Repentance, when it comes to salvation, is simply turning to Christ from whatever may be preventing you from fully trusting on Christ's finished work. Once we are saved, we then allow Christ to change us from the inside. When you got saved, something changed. You were given the new man. You were given the new creature. And that change will be manifested as long as you walk in the new man. If you walk in the old man, that change may not be manifested. That's why Paul over and over again says to walk in the spirit. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So that means we can, by definition, not walk in the spirit. We still have the old man. That's why. Now, here's an example of repentance in the context of salvation and not discipleship. Okay, If we are preaching the gospel to a person who holds to, let's say, Catholicism or Mormonism, okay, and therefore they hold to a salvation by faith plus works, they would then have to repent of what? Drinking alcohol? Repent of lying? Doing drugs? No, this isn't a works-based salvation. They have to repent of their belief in the work salvation being put forth by Catholicism, being put forth by Mormonism, okay? Otherwise, it would be impossible for him to have all of his faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in this case, his faith in Jesus Christ was still the only deciding factor Okay, repenting from sins 
giving up certain sins and walking in the spirit and putting on the new man to overcome sin in our life is something God commands those who are already saved to do. If you mix up discipleship and salvation, salvation is easy. Discipleship takes works. It creates a works-based salvation. Context is key in everything. For example, even God repents. And I could give you 10 verses right now. Here's one. And the Lord repented. Are you saying he turned from all his sins? The Lord quit drinking? The Lord quit drugs? Quit fornicating? No, the Lord repented of the evil which he had, which he thought to do unto his people. Exodus 32, 14. What is God repenting of? Sins? God has no sin. God repented more times than man in the Bible. And therefore, repenting does not always mean to turn from sins. Now, there are different views of repentance when it comes to Reformed Baptists, Free Grace, theologians, Independent Baptists. But regardless of the differing opinions, it does nothing to help Gavin with his burden of proof today. I also want to point out I heard almost no Bible. I heard a lot of talk on the Free Grace movement. We have Free Grace proponents as well as many Baptist groups, Reformed Baptist groups, who hold the eternal security. There's there's differences in opinions on preservation of saints, perser perseverance on, of the saints, but nonetheless, they still all, all hold to, if saved, always saved. So, so far, Gavin's failing his burden of proof, okay? I'd like to know from Gavin, King Solomon, his because of his wives, okay, Solomon's wives turned his heart away from the Lord entirely. He even went as far as to build monuments for false gods, and he honored multiple false deities. He clearly turned his back on God. Did King Solomon have uh, a, lose his salvation? He wrote books of the Bible. God does not have unregenerate, unsaved, unbelievers write books of the Bible, okay? Holy men spake as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. That would be a ridiculous argument. It's just so funny because Jesus says, okay, he who comes to me will never hunger. And he who comes to me will never thirst. Doesn't say we'll eventually thirst again, eventually hunger again. Okay, this is Daisy theology. He loves me not, he loves me. He loves me not, he loves me not. And hopefully, according to Gavin, by the time he dies, he's repented enough of his sins that the pedal is God loves me. Okay, this is anti-scripture, anti-gospel. Gavin implies we must keep coming to him our entire lives. No, that is not what the Bible says. It is the moment we come to him that we have, we get everlasting life. The moment I drink the living water, I have eternal life. Notice Gavin, as these conditionalists always do, spend a great deal of time referring to what? The church fathers, this was almost his entire opening. The church fathers and the reformers are more important to Gavin than the scriptures and sola scriptura, okay? Well, I want to point out, even when it comes to many of the reformers, they are just Catholic light, okay? And even proclaim that they did not leave the Catholic church. The Catholic church left them. <laughs> These are guys you want to look to? Nonetheless, most reformed Baptists today would hold to eternal security and either Pers perseverance of the saints or preservation of the saints. Therefore, most of his opening did nothing to help his position. What should matter is not whether my church father can beat up your church father, since we can spend 10 hours going over church father quotes where it sounds like some of them hold the eternal security, some don't. My church father can beat up your church father. It doesn't matter. It's what the Bible says that should be priority, okay? Now, that being said, there have been many Bible-believing Christians, millions of Bible-believing Christians in every age that have believed in the free grace position. There have been countless Christians who have existed alongside the Catholic Church who were considered heretics for simply believing the doctrines that Baptists believe today. Here are a few quotes from the book, The Trail of Blood, which I highly recommend that Gavin, I imagine, is unaware of, okay? During the period of the Dark Ages, there were in existence many Christians in many separate and independent churches, some of them dating back to the times of the apostles, which were never in any way connected with the Catholic Church. They always wholly rejected and repudiated the Catholics and their doctrines. This is a fact clearly demonstrated by credible history. The so-called church fathers Gavin wants to appeal to believed in what? Well, they believed in heretical doctrines held to by the Catholic Church today. Yeah, let's go look to Pope Francis to see what we should and shouldn't believe. Okay, they held to 
Heresies such as baptismal regeneration and infant baptism, purgatory, the worshiping of Mary, the doctrines of indulgences, transubstantiation, where they believe the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper was actually turned into the literal body and blood of Christ by, by the priest. They believed in image worship, saint worship. They rejected sola scriptura and mostly believed in some form of work, work salvation. And as I pointed out, a lot of the reformers actually held on to a lot of the heresies that the Catholic Church believed in, that the mother believed in. So here's another quote I want to point out too. These Christians were, um, th this is a quote from the book, The Trail of Blood. These Christians were perpetual objects of bitter and relentless persecution. History shows that during the period of the Dark Ages, about 12 centuries, beginning with AD 426, there were about 50 millions of these Christians who died martyr deaths. Very many thousands of others, both preceding and succeeding Dark Ages, died under the same hard hand of persecution. These Christians during these dark days of many centuries were called by many different names, all given to them by their enemies. Now, you guys might have heard of the Anabaptists, for example. Well, Sir Isaac Newton said, the Baptists are the only body of known Christians who have never symbolized with Rome. Okay, here's another quote from Cardinal Hosius. He says, were it not that the Baptists have been grievously tormented and cut off with the knife during the past 1,200 years, they would swarm in great number, more than the reformers that Gavin wants to look to and hold up so highly. We also know that in order to prevent the spread of any view contrary to those of the Catholics and so-called church leaders all throw, especially the Dark Ages, all writings of any sort other than those of the Catholics were gathered and burned. There, there were some very dark and bloody times throughout church history, okay? Here's the last thing I want to say on, on church history is um, in, in the book, A Defense of Free Grace Theology on page 63 of, of the chapter titled A Theological and Historical Investigation, Ken Wilson points to the existence of Christians in good standing with the early church who held to faith alone apart from works and that God's future judgment consisted only of payment, okay, reward, or punishment, temporary, of course, for how those Christians lived their lives before God. Heaven or hell was not in question. Faith alone saved. Early church fathers such as Augustine attempted to refute these Christians, oftentimes calling them Gnostic. Okay, so the point is they existed if the early church fathers were writing against them. They weren't writing against ghosts. The point here is Gavin is just plain wrong, needs to study more, and he needs to spend a little less time looking to men who hold all sorts of these strange doctrines to tell us what is and what isn't true. Uh, Praise, if you could uh, pause my timer real quick. I just want to share screen. Okay, I'm good to go. So here's a few objections that that you'll hear okay well it's a free gift they'll say but you know we can give give the gift back some claim that a person can always give the gift back however the clear testimony of scripture is that the gifts and calling of god are irrevocable romans 11 29 god who chose to give us this gift will not take it back so we couldn't return it even if we wanted to another thing is they'll say oh this is cheap grace Gavin will point, this is cheap grace, easy believism. Okay, there's nothing about easy about what Jesus did for us on the cross, okay? Cheap grace is actually believing that you can do something to maintain your salvation or to work to get salvation. No, it's all on Jesus. Listen, I went eight hours one, once without sinning, and then I woke up. Okay, we all sin every day. Paul himself said, I am carnal. And he talked about the battle between the old man and the new man. The new man is who goes to heaven. Grace costs us nothing, in this quote. Yet it costs God everything, his son's life. Moreover, while a Christian theoretically can live any way he pleases, we have seen that an unholy life forfeits both the abundant life Christ offers on earth and the future reward he offers at the judgment seat of Christ. It also brings a believer under the temporal judgment or discipline of God. Okay. And these uh, work salvationists, the conditionalists, they, they don't have any meaningful understanding of eternal rewards or temporal chastisement because they just believe if you're not abiding and they always use this abiding when abiding pertains to fellowship my kids abide in me when they're following my rules if they're not following my rules they're not abiding in me so these people say that say well 
I know I'm saved because I abide in Jesus. If I don't abide in Jesus, I'm not saved. Well, you're not always following the commandments. You're not always reading your Bible. You're not always walking in the spirit. So you may die, okay, out of fellowship with God. The prodigal son was out of fellowship with God. He repented and restored that fellowship. But if you theoretically died out of fellowship, well, from a positional sense, you're, you're saved. You're going to heaven. You may lose rewards. And uh, there are other things you can lose, but not your salvation. So I want to point out this too, because um, the, the conditionalists are just trapped. They got nothing. Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. In this verse, drinks is expressed in the form of a past tense Greek verb. That means that all it takes is one drink and a fountain of life springs up from inside. There is no need for multiple drinks. This spring of life continuously meets the need of one who has a single drink. A person does not need to continue drinking in order to have the gift Jesus is offering. And we know we can't give the, back, the gift back because that's what they'll say. We know the, the gifts of God are irrevocable, so that's not going to work. A one-time drink will gain the person this everlasting life. At that point, once one has the gift, they will afterward never thirst, metaphorically speaking. The resultant life must therefore be irrevocable, eternal security. It is a gift that you can never earn and a gift you can never lose. It is received in a moment in time transaction. Okay, so the point is there are so many verses that tell us salvation cannot be lost. Okay, we have promise after promise. We've been passed from death unto life. And these conditionalists like Gavin, they, they don't understand the, the various aspects of our spiritual education. They think discipleship, salvation is the same thing, or they think every single time salvation yeah, is saved is used in the Bible, that it's referring to eternal salvation when in fact it's not. Okay. And here's one last point I want to bring up because this is something I hear all the time as well. And it has to do with justification. Okay. And uh, you got justification, adoption, and they'll say you can sin your your way to spiritual abortion. Okay, I want to point this out, and then and then uh, I'm done. I got about 30 seconds here. Since all of our sins, past, present, future, are forgiven by Jesus Christ and is eternally sufficient sacrifice, there is no sin that can cause us to lose our relationship to Him. Okay, notice this. Notice this. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you some trespasses. Most trespasses, only your past trespasses. No, all trespasses. So therefore, when we sin, it is in the flesh. It is in the old man. We can lose things, but not our salvation because it's the new man that inherits the kingdom of God. And I yield. Awesome. Great. That was a full rebuttal. So um, we'll now transition now into the open discussion for 30 minutes. And uh, since... Gavin started. I guess he'll be he'll begin this as well. Um, so if you guys want to go ahead and get into that, I'll start the timer when you guys are ready to go. I'm just wondering, um, Donny, how do you feel about we take turns asking questions? I ask a question, you answer, then you ask a question, I answer that kind of thing. Hey, sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. Okay, cool. So I need to make a plea here um, for. Um, more professionalism, please. Um, I was disappointed that you made no attempt to steal me and my argument, and you've already insulted me twice. One about uh, probably I've never read a book called whatever, and that I need to uh, do more study and stop looking to men. So I'd appreciate... Well, you, well have you read The Trail of Blood? I'd, I'd appreciate it if you'd keep... Um, your comments more professional and not sort of personal. Well, don't slap and run, Gavin. I want to make a point. No, hey, don't slap and run, a hey, moderator. I, I don't like slapping and running. I want to make a point. So Gavin spent most of his opening on the church fathers, the reformers, okay? And I'm pointing out that I don't think Gavin read this book, and if he did, it went over his head because this book and the historical data found let's in that book actually refutes his his position pertaining to the Let's just try to, to keep fathers. the digs to a minimal. I know it's a passion debate, understandable. Let's just try to keep the digs to the minimal. I mean, both sides. And I'm not picking any side. It's both sides. So, both Gavin, sides. if you've read that book, I apologize. Have you read that book, The Trail of Blood? Um, no. No, I haven't. 
Well, then I wasn't lying or anything like that. It was a valid prediction. So what's your question, uh, my good man, Gavin? Um, okay, so so I'll ask the first question. So um, being being a free grocer and an ET, eternal securist, eternal securist, <laughs> and, and you think that those who have, have had faith, have had faith, um, and then fall away from the faith were never saved to begin with. That seems to be what I'm what I'm hearing from you. So, so how how do you deal with um, the likes of Lucifer, for example? And I'll I'll just read um, from Ezekiel um, Ezekiel twenty eight fourteen through fifteen. Um, God is speaking through the prophet, and he's and he's saying, "I put a terrifying angel there to guard you. You lived on my holy mountain." and walked among sparkling gems. Your conduct was perfect from the day you were created until you began to do evil. So here's a created being that was, to use your terms, um, you know, had faith in God and then fell. So how, how do you deal with, with the likes of him, for example? So a, a couple it's of not only, It's not only Ezekiel. It appears in Isaiah and also Revelation. Sure. So a couple of questions there. Let me um, – I'll start with your your um, your second question about, about Lucifer, and then I'll go into whether or not people can fall away in a sense that because we know people can fall away from church, especially over the last year, people have fallen away from church. A lot of times that's what the Bible is talking about, falling away from sound teaching, falling away from church, but not falling away from regeneration. As I pointed out, if hypothetically a truly regenerated, justified, predestined for glorification saint could fall away, it'd be the old man who's who's falling away because the old man has no sin. The new man can't fall away. But when it comes to Lucifer, he was not a child of God. He was not human, okay? He may have been a creature, but the saving blood of Jesus Christ, Gavin, I would assume you would know, and I think everybody in the chat would agree, applies to humans and not to angels. I noticed earlier you also mentioned that Judas was, was regenerated and then uh, went from regeneration to unregeneration. Well, that's just completely false. Uh, the Bible says uh, Judas was a devil since the beginning, never saved. That's why we have passages such as Matthew 7, where we have people who within Christianity, these aren't people who are Buddhists or Hindus or Muslims. No, they're saying, Lord, Lord, they are doing works in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Okay, they said, haven't we done many wonderful works? Haven't we prophesied in their name? But we know according to Matthew 7, they did not do the will of the Father, which is to believe on the Son. So here's false professors, false converts within Christianity who Jesus Christ says, depart from me for I never knew you. Okay, so the point is, yes, there are false professors. The okay, okay. Can, false can, I, can I stop you there? Can I, my, my question was just about Lucifer. So right. well, now, no, no, no. now you can ask a question. Okay. You can ask a question now. I, I appreciate that. I, I do want to just put forth this verse, especially for the audience that that, that I um, that I mentioned. Um, not only Matthew seven, because I just want to point out the existence of false converts exists, and that's why First John two nineteen says they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So, yeah, we, we clearly have people claiming Christ but not actually saved. So my question to you then would be, um, and to put it into context for you, is, um, well, I want to ask you what your best verse is that we can lose our salvation. But before we go down that road, I am curious when it comes, because I put forth a lot of verses in my uh, opening statement that I don't feel you adequately dealt with. So even if we just focus on John 5, 24, and then maybe we can go to one of your verses. So the fact that we actually see present tense, as in we have everlasting life, we also see the future tense that we should not come into condemnation. If we could lose our salvation, then that would be false. This would be a lie because yes, we could come into condemnation. And it also says past tense, we've already been passed from death unto life. So my question is, how do you fit this in uh, with your your position of uh, conditional security that we can once again go from 
life back to death. We, we can be in a state of spiritual death again. Now go ahead, take your time. Sure. So I'm going to refer to the words of Christ regarding um, our, our salvation is conditional because there's probably no better, there's no, probably no better authority than Christ our Savior. So let's look at Matthew 5, verses 27 through 30. And Jesus said, You heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone looking at a woman so as to desire, to desire her already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye is causing you to fall, and the Greek word is scandalizo, I think, tear it out and throw it from you. For it's better for you that one of your body parts perish than your whole body not be thrown into Gehenna. This is Jesus speaking, remember. And your right hand is causing you to fall, scandalizo again. Cut it off and throw it from you. For it's better for you that one of your body parts perish than for your whole body not to go into Gehenna. So that's that seems pretty conditional to me because the idea of gouging out your right eye or cutting off your right hand, needless to say, demands a violent, decisive measure for removing the source of temptation. The, re the reason is... Well, Gavin, is, I, I just want you to address, and I can address that, but 524, like I said, we see present tense, future tense, past tense. I don't think you're dealing with the with, with the tax because right away, as you conditionals do, you jump to another verse, which are you implying that that if we sin or sin too much, that we can now go from life back to death? Is, is that your position here? No, of course not. You know that. Okay, so then can you explain in your own words that verse? Exegete that passage you just So, so which, which one is it? Luke 24? Well, the Sorry, verse you just referred Ma to. Sorry, what is it? Matthew, Matthew what? Matthew Which was he talking about? Well, the verse that you brought forth as an answer to John 5, 24. Because here's Matthew 5, oh, Matthew 5, 27 to 30. Right. Right. Yeah. So where in that do you see a contradiction to, to, to John 5, 24, where we see past tense, we've been passed from death unto life, as in Jesus guarantees those who believe in him will never be condemned shall not come into condemnation this is the future tense we literally have the present tense future tense and past tense all within one verse yeah. so my question is how do you interpret that verse because i noticed your response was to go to matthew 25 which is fine we can deal with that text too no, it's, i'm just it's, curious it's, as to your interpretation with this no, it's matthew 5 27 to 30. um so the reason is to reason is seen and to fall away skid, skid, Scan is the Greek the Greek word a strong term that does not simply indicate temptation to general sin but that which leads one virtually into apostasy it's far better the text is saying it's far better to suffer in losing your most important appendage <laughs> than to lose everything at the final judgment one must violently throw away everything that causes the lust, lest their spiritual life and ultimately their eternal destiny be destroyed in the process. Well, Gavin, it, it seems like your your response, um, and I guess we'll just leave it up to the audience. I think you're um, dodging the text. You're not exegeting the the text that I provided. And as conditionalists usually do, you're you're just jumping to another. What is, it, what is the text you provided? What, what, what's the text? Uh, we were dealing with with John five twenty four, but you know, we'll just leave it up to the audience to see if if you dealt with it. But I, I do want to say one thing, and then we'll we'll hand it back to you if you want to ask me a question. I would like to know what what your favorite verse is that that says we can actually lose our salvation. Um, but if you're saying that someone can fall away and deny Christ, and then therefore go from regeneration to unregeneration, yeah. The first passage that, that comes to my mind is 2 Timothy 2.13 that says, if we are faithless, he remains unfaithful? No, it says he remains faithful as he cannot deny himself. So if we do have, unfortunately, someone who falls away and may lose rewards in the next life in the millennial kingdom and may be chastised to the point of death, we clearly see here that Christ himself will still remain faithful. 
So how do you how do you explain that then? I'm curious. Well, you know what covenant means, eh? Covenant takes two parties. So God has a covenant with us. We have a covenant with God. God will never give up his end of the bargain, which means um, there's only one side who's capable of reneging on the covenant, and that's mere mortals. Right, but I've already showed you the passage where God's gifts are irrevocable. So even if you wanted to give back the gift, the Bible clearly says that the gifts of God are irrevocable. So when you have a gift, you didn't do anything to earn the gift. Sure, yeah. So how do you explain that? I mean, if, if the gifts of God are irrevocable, are you saying then you can give back the gift? Um, you can... Um, uh, you can... I always forget this word, prose. You can uh, fall away. Need, or you no, it's not. Oh, it's, it's better than better than fall away. It's um, forfeit. 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 Yeah. Right. You can right. You, you can forfeit your salvation, and people oh. do. People do. Oh, here's the thing. Hey, you can dress it up any way you want, forfeit, revoke, give it back. It doesn't matter. Okay. So here's the problem: is scripture. We should use scripture to interpret scripture not anecdotes. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. God who chose to give us this gift will not take it back. So we couldn't return it if we wanted to. So you're saying we could forfeit it. But yet yes. what we find here is that's not possible because God is telling us, no, the free gift of salvation, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus is irrevocable. So deal with that tax. If it's irrevocable, how in the world can you give it back or forfeit it? Like say, I forfeit this gift, have it back. Deal with the text. That's really easy. People people lose their faith or forfeit their faith. They do do that. And there's plenty of plenty of examples in the Bible of that. Well, I, I don't think once again you're you're dealing with the text. But what would then be your your uh, best passage that, that you could point to that actually demonstrates what what you are saying, that we can actually go from a state of regeneration. Uh, so let's hold on. Is it my turn to ask a question or are you asking two questions back to back? Actually, you know what? Go ahead. You can ask a, a question. Okay. So I, I know you're really hot on um, once you're regenerated, uh, you cannot you cannot fall. You cannot. Um, what's that word, prose? <laughs> forfeit. Forfeit. You cannot forfeit your faith. In God or Christ Jesus, how would you how would you deal um, with Cain, um, Donnie? Cain had a choice, but he made the wrong choice. So how would you deal with that? I'm going to be honest with you. This is just as bad as the Lucifer argument. So when it comes to when it comes to Cain, okay, Cain trusted in himself. Cain did not bring a free will offering. Cain did not bring a sacrifice like Abel did. This is why I always point out there's only two religions in the world, Cain and Abel do and done. Because a lot of critics will say, if your God is real, why is it so confusing? Why are there so many religions? Well, most religions, Jesus said, narrow is the way and few there be that find it. Most religions, 99% of religions, you name it, they trust to them in themselves. They have some sort of works salvation okay and that is Cain he brought his works to God Abel brought a sacrifice our sacrifice is Christ and when we rest in Christ and his finished work then obviously that work is enough and therefore the true biblical Christian who puts it all on Christ falls into the Abel category Falls so, into okay. the done category. So down oh, here in New Zealand, Zealand, down Zealand, here in New Zealand, down here in New Zealand, we call that a dodge better than OJ Simpson. I'm still waiting for an answer. How do you deal with Cain? He was never saved. How do you deal with Cain? He was never saved. He had a choice. He had a choice, right? He was righteous. He had a choice, and he became unrighteous. How do you deal with that? Are you saying? Is it your position that Cain was born regenerate? No, Cain fell. Cain um, forfeited his faith. Right? That's clear. Cain was born unregenerate and died unregenerate. That's my answer. He brought his works. To, sure I've never actually met. I've never actually met anybody that thought Cain was saved. 
I mean, I I'd love to find out in the live chat. People type one if they thought Kane was ever saved. No, Kane was not saved. The whole the whole story uh, behind Cain and Abel is that it is Abel who brought the free will sacrifice. It is Cain who brought forth his works. I mean, that's my answer. I mean, do you have so, I a couple questions? So if you so have another Cain, question, so so, so you you agree with me that Cain forfeited his faith, right? No, no, no. Cain wow. never had Cain never had regeneration to forfeit. Wow, Gavin, okay. are we born regenerate or unregenerate? Um, even people on your side are pointing we're out born that we're saved. born neither. So you can you can have a question now. Where you go? Well, wait, wait, no. I got to know if you know basic soteriology. You're the one who provided the definitions of justification, regeneration, sanctification, glorification, which just means future sanctification. Are we born unregenerate, reprobate, or regenerate? That's my question. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, you can stop the insults by saying, I've got to know if you know the meaning of, and then whatever your buzzword is. Okay. You're using an argument assuming that Cain was born regenerated. So that's why I now need to know. So we're not no, talking I'm using an argument. What that, is your position on regeneration? I'm using an argument that Cain had faith and forfeited it. So it's your position, contrary to just about everybody, that Cain had regeneration that that he lost. Um, it's my it's my um, position that Cain forfeited his faith. Okay, okay. Well, let me ask you um, let me ask you a question then. Sure. Um, what is your and I want to pull it up here. What is the difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. <laughs> I have no idea. No idea. So, and, and here's the problem that I find with the conditionalists or those that put forth a works salvation is, is, is they don't know how to differentiate between these important aspects. Okay. One is salvation or sonship. And discipleship, fellowship, for example, which deals with abiding or the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne. Because we know that the judgment seat of Christ is where we as believers. OK, Paul says we as in believers, those that are regenerated shall appear and be judged according to our works in terms of rewards and treasure in heaven and in the kingdom. And that's why we can be given special crowns, blessings, and privileges, as you see here. While the great white throne judgment, as we see in Revelation, where the dead, right, those that have not been spiritually made alive, are judged according to their works to show them that without Christ, without faith, they are condemned. So here's the point, is when we have Paul telling us that there will be unfruitful believers who are tested, their works are wood, hay, and stubble, and they will be burned, but they themselves will be saved in terms of rewards. They've lost all the rewards. How do you understand that from your soteriology if, if there is no if there is no difference or if there's no meaningful reason to hold to eternal rewards? Um, yeah, go ahead. Take your time. I'm just curious as to your thoughts on that. So, Okay, so you're asking me a question now? Well, I, even, even just respond to what I said, because I find that the conditionalists don't realize that we can lose things. We can lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. But you telling me that you don't know the difference tells me that a lot of the passages you look to to say we can lose our salvation actually have to do with losing rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. This is why it's so important to understand these distinctions, distinctions between position and experience, differences between um, sonship, discipleship. So... Yeah, in your in your soteriology, where do you fit eternal rewards? How do you understand the judgment seat of Christ? Okay, um, so in my oh, soteriology, yeah. which just means the gospel of salvation, a saving, preservation, rescue, deliverance. How do I understand what? Well, <laughs> how do I understand the, the what the great white throne and the judgment seat of Christ? See, here's the thing. Is that your answer? Is, sorry, is that your question? Well, my question was, what's the difference between the judgment seat of Christ? And, and I said, I don't know. I said, you I don't, don't know. know. And now I'm showing you what the difference is and how it fits the free grace position 
okay? But the conditional position has no meaningful understanding or even reason to understand the difference. And that's why typically when I ask the conditionalist that question, they always say the same thing. Well, I don't know because they're always thinking if we live in willful, willful, willful sin or we are unfruitful or we fall away or whatever, you name it, they think we are losing salvation. When the Bible tells us no, we have been passed from death unto life. We shall never thirst, never hunger. No man can pluck us out of the Father's hand, including you. You're a man. You have a Y chromosome. But we can lose rewards. We can lose fellowship. We can fail in discipleship. But you guys don't understand that. I mean, you had two weeks to prep for the debate. I don't know why you... So here's the point. I'm going to well, say understand. this one last thing. I'm going to say Hold this on, one last thing. No, 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 over no. talking. Hold on, guys. We got to stop over talking. Yeah. So... Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so who, who was talking before we making their point? We're going to let that person speak. I'm not sure. Well, I've, answered, I've, answered, I've answered Donnie's question. I don't know the difference between the judgment seat or the great okay, white Okay, so let SFT respond to that now. Go ahead, SFT. Okay, so the last thing I'll say to that is I want to point out to the audience because obviously these, these debates are for the audience, okay? We don't necessarily think we're going to, uh, you know, change the mind of our interlocutors, but ask yourselves, the fact that Gavin doesn't understand the difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment, does that tell you that he's accurately exegeting these passages, not knowing that these passages may be dealing with a loss of eternal rewards versus a loss of our position or a loss of our actual salvation resulting in spiritual abortion? So, uh, yeah, anyways, go ahead. Um, okay. Okay. Well, some, okay. So here's his something I do know before I ask my question um, the the words that I'm hearing and, and and the sentences I'm hearing from you are drifting dangerously close to um, Gnostic type speech but anyway I'll ask my question how do you deal with so you're just gonna um, slap and run um, I think the the language you're using um, is is getting pretty close to the edge of, of uh, Gnostic theology. Such as? Most of what you've been saying. Uh, eternal rewards. This kind of, okay, eternal rewards. That's that's an example. Eternal rewards is not. Eternal, re, eternal, eternal rewards. Why in 1 John, which Smokey saying in the, in the chat has no argument, why is the word used, the Greek underlying word, why is it pueo and not prazo, indicating that the whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin is the new man. But you're saying that we can lose the new man. It's the new man, the spirit that's been passed from death into life. That's not Gnostic. That's scriptural. So how do you deal with the underlying Greek text that shows us the word is pueo, which means one single act and not something that's continual? How do you are understand we, that? Are, are, are we the spiritual man now? Are you the spiritual man now? The spirit is Are you the spiritual man? If, if I am not sinning, I am man? walking in the spiritual man. If I am sinning, I'm in the, I'm in the flesh. Wow. That is, that's, that is Gnostic, man. Wait a if minute, wait claim, a minute. If Gavin, you claim, are you always if you in? Claim, if are you, you always claim, in the new man? Just, you need to be quiet. You need to be quiet. If you're claiming that you have the spiritual man and you walk in the spiritual man, yep. that is straight, straight from the, the textbook of Gnostic belief. Okay, don't slap it around. Let me respond uh, to the moderator. Give us equal time here. Once again, let me ask you. Well, I haven't asked the question. Hold on, yet. hold on. Okay. I'm let not going to ask the question. Respond. I'm just going to ask the question. Gavin, Gavin, hold on, Gavin. Let him respond, and we'll, we'll come back to you, Gavin. Go ahead, SFT. Okay. So Gavin's position, because I don't want to ask a question, to be fair, and then you can correct me if I'm wrong. According to this verse in First John, because Gavin doesn't want to exegete it. He just wants to accuse me of being Gnostic for some reason. It says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Well, we all sin. Elsewhere in that same book, it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, okay? And we make him a liar. People know we're a liar when we say we don't sin because everybody sins. So this verse, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Not one single sin. The underlying Greek word is pueo. That means not something that's continual like a lot of the conditionalists will say. This means, no, this is talking about the spiritual man. So Gavin's interpretation is saying that 
He doesn't sin. But I recognize when I walk in the new man, that is when I am abiding in Christ. That is when I'm walking in the light. That is when I am not sinning. But right here, he that committeth sin is of the devil. Oh, that's weird. We have not commit sin and commit a sin. That's because we still have the flesh in the old man. And when we walk in the old man, we will sin. We can hate our brother. We can fail to forgive our brother's trespasses. We will sin. That's why Paul says, we live in the spirit. Let us also walk in the spirit. So I'm not, uh, I'd like to know how Gavin understands this then. I want to see an actual exegesis of this text. And I yield. Okay. Take me your time. So, so here's my next question. Um, speaking about um, the... Actually, Gavin, I'm going to have to step in really quick. See, he posed a, a, a question for you. Maybe you could answer that question. That'd be wonderful. Uh, to stick with, we're going to try to, we're going to, we're going to explicitly stay with each question. And so we're not going to try to veer off. And this, if that's okay, to stay with this question, sure. he's going to have to answer your question. Okay. Awesome. Can, can, can you answer the, can you ask the question again? Okay. So we, we see a dichotomy. We see, Somebody who doesn't sin, somebody who sins. Obviously, we know we all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, we make him a liar. So therefore, how do you exegete First John, where it's my point that the whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, not one single sin. Since we all sin, it has to be the spirit. It has to be the new man, the inward man that Paul talks about constantly that we should walk in, that he wants to walk in and he doesn't do the things that he wants to do because of the outward man and the old man. Point is, we have the old man, the new man, the new man is who inherits the kingdom of God. So my question is, how do you then understand that? Because you're saying what I am putting forth is Gnostic. Therefore, how do you understand this passage? Who is so it? For, that is can you give me the reference? Can you give me the reference? First John. Yeah. Can you for, give me the um, reference? First yeah. John, first John three. Let me see. I have all I'm, my references. I'm going to have to jump here really quick because we're coming up to the last minute and a half. So after Gavin answers this question, we're going to probably go into our conclusion, concluding remarks, and then we'll go into questions and oh. answers. We have a bunch, man. We have a bunch, so we're going to have to get this done quickly. I, I will. I will say this, praise. Since Gavin didn't use all his time. You can add another 10 minutes to it so we can okay. talk about some okay. of his best work. Because I want to be fair, Gavin. I know that you, Gavin, it, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll let you. So it's First John 3, 9. But then, I, but then I also want to give you the opportunity to point to what some of your so-called best scriptures are that demonstrate your position, just to be fair. So, yeah, praise. Give us an extra 10 minutes. Then we'll go sure. into the conclusion. Yeah. Go ahead, Gavin. I'm going to mute. So, the whole so, you, so your question to me is how would I exegete? First John chapter three, verse nine. You got it. You got it. Okay. So let's see. Let's see. Uh, let no one deceive you, my children. Whoever does what is right is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. Whoever continues to sin belongs to the devil because the devil has sinned from the very beginning. The son of man appeared for this very reason to destroy what the devil had done. None of those who... Uh, children of God continue to sin, but God's very nature is in them. And because God is their father, they cannot continue to sin. This is the clear difference between God's children and the devil's children. All those who do what is right or do not love others are not God's children. That's that's cool. That's awesome. Well, let so me, you, want me to, you want you want you want me to exegete that, right? And I and I want to point out that you, so the interpretations are either which you put forth. This is the Christian who doesn't continually sin, or is right. it as the Bible says, "Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin." You're saying the "doth not" should be translated as a Christian who doesn't continue in sin, make a practice of sinning. Well, if that was the case, the underlying Greek word should be prazo, right? Prazo, practice. Okay, that's where we get practice from. But there's another Greek word, pueo, which literally means one single act. So 
if your interpretation or exegesis of First John was was correct, we should find prazo as the underlying Greek word, but we don't find that. We find the word pueo, which means this verse is best understood as whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin because this is the new man. He has no sin. Our spirit is, is what's regenerated, not our flesh. Gavin, I don't know about you, but I still got the same aches and pains as when I wrestled back in, back in high school. That's because we didn't get a regenerated body yet. It's the new man who inherits the kingdom of God. He has no sin. And that's why to say that we could lose the new man who's been passed from death unto life is anti-scriptural and anti-gospel. Uh, go ahead. So your question is, is still, how do I exegete that passage, right? If you want, you can ask me a question because we did get your exegesis. I was just showing the audience why it was wrong. Well, I didn't give an exegesis for the for the passage, but my exegesis is simply this is very clear. Um, if we indeed say we love God, um, we will do what is right and we will not hate others. We, we will not um, um, hold a grudge against uh, our brothers and sisters or even our neighbours um, because those are actions of someone who serves the devil because there's only two gods this side of eternity, Satan or the God of the Bible, and which one are you going to serve? If you do wrong, then you're going to be serving Satan. If you do right, you're going to be serving um the Lord God of the Bible. So here's my question for you. And this is all coming back to about how uh, someone who uh, is a believer and then forfeits their faith. This is a warning. This is a warning from Christ our Saviour. So it's Luke chapter 12 and starting at verse 42. The Lord said to his disciples, so he's speaking to his disciples, it's very, very um, specific, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master will put in charge of his servants to give them food allowance at the proper time? Blessed is the servant to as blessed is the servant whom his master will find doing so when he comes. Truly I tell you, I will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that servant says in his heart, here's the warning, my master is staying away for a long time and he begins to beat the male and female servants to eat and drink and become drunk, then the master of that servant will arrive on a day when he was not expected and, an, and at an hour that his servant did not know. The master will cut him in two and assign him a place with the unbelievers. So how do you deal with that passage? What's the passage exactly? I want to pull it up. It's, it's Luke chapter 12. Starts at verse 42. So it's a warning. It's a warning passage. Okay, so <clears throat> let's pull it up here. I find it funny that, that we see no mention, and I'm going to address it, but we see no mention of Hebrews 10, Hebrews 6. We see no mention of 2 Peter, John 15, Jude 1, Galatians 5. It's almost like Gavin has recognized that he has no case when it comes to the most common. Hey, Donnie, Donnie, person. Donnie, Donnie, can you stop with the waffle and just answer the question? Okay, so let's pull it up. So Luke 12, 42 verse to 48. Okay, so let's see here. And you're saying this is uh, a case of... Um, this is a warning, a okay. warning from Christ our Savior regarding our salvation. So, so my explanation for this, uh, without digging too deep into it, I think it's pretty obvious. And I can see why you're using this verse because it goes back to earlier where you failed to identify the difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. So the issue we're dealing with here is rulership, not actual salvation or kingdom entrance. <laughs> <laughs> but those, and you laugh, but here's the thing. The only ones laughing are those that, that witnessed you failing to understand what the judgment seat of Christ is. So at the judgment seat of Christ, all okay, believers okay, will okay. Okay. Can we stop we will all, can we we will stop? Listen, you're can the one who laughed. You're the one who laughed. Hold on, guys. We've got to stop that we're talking stop. here. Let's, let's, let's bring it stop. back. Can we stop? Can we stop? Can we stop? Um, 
I'm so not. Nice. So it looks can like this is a reference. Can well, you want to, you asked a question. I want to finish my, my answer. You started laughing while I was giving my answer, which was disrespectful, but I'm pointing out the fact the only reason you're laughing is because you're applying this to regeneration because you don't understand the fact that we will, as believers, have our works judged not for salvation, but for kingdom rulership. So we have a lot of believers. It looks like here we have believers who will either rule with Christ in terms of the millennial kingdom versus just entering. Because we know there are believers who all their works will be burned up and they will be like the least in heaven. OK, this is a type of, of chastisement, just like we see on this earth. We experience chastisement when we sin, when we are out of fellowship. So therefore, that's my that's my response. We are looking at a we loss jump of here really quick, guys. We're coming. On, we're coming to 40 minutes now on our open discussion. We got a lot of questions and a lot yeah, let's, of let's, chats. Let's OK, let's, let's go to the closing. Let's, let's go to the closing. I know because, Gavin gets um, I'm not I'm not uh, going to be part of this. Um, tossing insults or passive aggressive type garbage that I'm hearing. All right. So since Gavin, you started it, then we're going to let you go first in the end for your first, I mean, the, you'll be the first of the concluding remark and then we'll hand it off to SFT. Then we'll go into super chats and Q and A. Yeah, sure. Okay. Look, um, I have a contention with um, ET and free grace theology Eternal uh, security and free grace theology is nothing new. Um, it emerged during the time of the Reformation, also emerged during the 17th century and the 20th century, and now it's with us even in the 21st century, and it's called the um, crossless gospel. Um, at the foundation of these controversies is um, the erroneous theology of eternal security and free grace. Um, there are 78 biblical passages that are, uh, are called conditional um, salvation passages where believers and unbelievers are warned um, what will happen to them um, should they lack faith in Christ Jesus. That's a lot of, that's a lot of passages. That's a lot of passages. And a good way to maybe uh, explain this is, is an illustration of um, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and young Charlie, all right? So um, Charlie's the young boy. He's probably about eight or nine years old. And Willy Wonka gives him an everlasting gobstopper. This is a gobstopper that will never, ever run out. It will keep going for eternity, right? Willy, uh, Charlie's got this everlasting gobstopper. He loves it, all right, because it never, never gets smaller. It never disappears. Oh, sorry about the glare, folks. Maybe I'll put my, put my head there. It might be better. So, so Charlie's got this everlasting gobstopper. He has possession of this everlasting gobstopper. Just as the Christian, um, our Christian brother or sister, has possession of eternal life through faith in Christ. Sola fide. Not through works. Sola fide. Through faith in Christ. However... One day, Charlie's a bit sick of the gobstopper and he gives it back to Willy Wonka, therefore giving up possession of the eternal gobstopper. Now, someone who is a believer who gives up on their faith in Jesus Christ forfeits their faith in Jesus Christ, therefore forfeits their right to eternal security or eternal life. And that's probably about as simple as I can make it. Um, I think uh, uh, Donnie was straying into dangerous, dangerous Gnostic territories with some of his interpretations, um, which we don't need to hear about. But uh, like I said, there's 14, verse, 14 passages from the mouth of Jesus Christ our, uh, himself warning us um, about the conditions we must meet in order to achieve eternal salvation. One of them, obviously, is sola fide. Uh, but, you know, if Jesus is, is warning, warning the disciples and unbelievers about what will happen if you break your covenant that you have with the Lord God, then I think that's pretty good evidence that uh, salvation is 
conditional on us keeping our part of the bargain, our part of the covenant. Covenant means a contract between one, uh, two or more parties. And with that, I'll yield the rest of my time to my learned opponent. Awesome, Gavin. Thanks for your concluding remark. And now it's your turn, SFT, for your concluding remark. And we'll head into Super Chats and questions. All right. Well, I appreciate this this debate. Tons of fun. Um, and and I, I hope as many people as possible watch this because it really shows just how strong and irrefutable the uh, eternal security position is. Uh, Gavin mentioned a bunch of verses, uh, but didn't actually present them because I think he knew that those verses are so easily refuted that he wouldn't be able to withstand cross-examination on, on those verses. But this has been a ton of fun. E e eternal security has, has really shown it, its strength. Once again, he brings up the church father's arguments and how this is new. I literally spent five minutes of my uh, rebuttal just destroying that. He just repeating the same talking points. Conditionalists do that a lot. Uh, he also said this is Gnostic. But I think everybody in the chat could see that his uh, response to First John 3, 9 and the new man, the new man who inherits the kingdom of God was, was lacking. So he can uh, resort to this whole Gnostic argument, but he didn't deal with the text. He didn't deal with the underlying Greek words, prazo and pueo. And, and that's fine. He can have inconsistent soteriology all he wants. So I have six minutes here. So why don't we go over some of these verses and just demolish them? So we've got uh, John uh, 15 that they'll oftentimes look to and fail to understand that we're looking to temporal judgment. Praise, I hear a little bit of back background noise. Just make sure you gentlemen are, are muted. Uh, they don't recognize, see, here's the thing. The, these op opponents of free grace soteriology, they want to mix everything, right? They don't understand the difference between the judgment seat, the great white throne. They don't understand the difference between earthly salvation and eternal salvation. They also don't understand the fact that fire and burning doesn't always re refer to hell. Okay, so when we see burning and fire used, most oftentimes we see that it's being referred to as judgment here and now, earthly salvation. And we see unfruitful believers in John 15 are actually being cast away in terms of their work being done in preaching the gospel because they are unfruitful. So they are now under the chastisement of God. Okay, this is why it's so important to understand God's chastening. He chastens all, all, every son whom he receives. A good line of evidence as to whether or not you're saved is, are you being chastised? Or do you have that war between the old man and the new man? Can we jump out of the father's hand? That's what Gavin is, implies. Well, no, uh, he had no answer for the gifts of God are irrevocable, but apparently he, he, he thinks we can forfeit that. It's contrary to scripture. That's fine. Uh, John 10, 28 doesn't say no, no one is able to, says no one is able to snatch them out, which would include the believer. We're looking at God, who is not man, and man. And he's saying, no man, that includes you. Because people will often say, well, obviously that means it doesn't imply us. You know, we can jump out of the Father's hand. No, God is a lot stronger than us. And when it says no man, because it's coming from God in God's perspective, that includes you. If Of course, you got a Y chromosome. And I think Gavin does. So no, he can't jump out of, out of the Father's hand. Uh, another big one actually used is, is Romans 11, which is just hilarious. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time this one was brought up, incorrectly, I'd be a, a trillionaire pro probably. But this is dealing with uh, corporal election, not individual election. We're not talking about one Jew and one Gentile. Okay, it's talking about groups, nations. The, the unbelieving Jews, due to unbelief, were, were um, cut off. The Gentiles, due to belief, were, of course, grafted in. And we see nations all the time turn away from God and turn away from Christian morals, and therefore they are cut off. So nothing to do with, uh, with salvation. Here's some important verses on, on chastisement, okay? Uh, for one, here's probably the most um, commonly cited verse. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So when it comes to Hebrews 10, which is a commonly cited verse, but yet just so easy to, to demolish. We know that living in unconfessed sin will result in severe chastisement. People in Hebrews 10 sin willfully with no care to forsake and confess their sins. Remember, Jesus Christ is the sacrifice once and for all. He has forgiven all trespasses if we 
believe on him. Okay, salvation in the Bible is oftentimes referring to the salvation of our bodies. The salvation we often see in verses, those that promote conditional security are actually dealing with the salvation of our bodies from the temporal punishment and chastisement of God. When we are disobedient and sin willfully against him without repenting of those sins, we will endure chastisement and punishment. If we as a child of God sin willfully, you aren't going to hell, but you are going to have a very angry father who is going to chasten you and discipline you and maybe even take one you minute. before your time. Um, another commonly cited one here too, Matthew 25, sheep and goats. Sheep are the blessed and righteous, signifying they are saved. Goats are unsaved. Matthew 7, just hilarious. He said, I never knew you. James 2 is dealing with uh, believers who have faith, but unprofitable faith. James is saying, get to work. That's all it talks about. Parable of the four, four souls. I wish we could have got into that one. And another one that's really overused is Ezekiel 18, uh, which it's interesting to know that anybody with any type of theological understanding would would recognize this is dealing with the physical life physical death temporal blessings and curses and not actually dealing with eternal salvation and it's so funny because there's no clear answer to well how much sin or how little fruit and second peter 2 is another hilarious one that that is constant uh constantly being cited. I got 15 seconds here. So unfortunately, we don't have time to get to uh, those last ones. Hebrews 6, unbelievers have become reprobate due to willful rejection of the gospel. So there's no text in scripture that goes against eternal security. And uh, thank you so much for this debate. Awesome, guys. That concludes the debate. It was an amusing debate, entertaining, and um, we'll leave it to the audience to see what they have to say. There's two after shows. There'll be one on my channel, and there'll be one on Nephilim Freeze channel. So wherever you guys want to go, go. We'll see you. We'll see you there. And but praise. now, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, SFT. Because we've gone two hours, and now we're going into the Q&A. What I'd like to do is take a, a two-minute intermission before the, before a twenty-minute Q and A, just to you know what what goes in must come out. So let's yeah. do a two-minute intermission and uh, catch our breath before some of these great questions. All righty. Intermission is over. looks like we've had a great chat, over 70 people. Uh, tons of fun. Can't believe it's been two hours. Very engaging debate. And uh, yeah, praise. Hand it over to you, my good man, for our Q&A. Um, due to priority, if we do not get to yours, I mean, we're going to try to. Um, we're going to have to go Super Chats first. Um, if that's just the way we have to do it, because of course we just give more priority to those who pay. So, um, we're going to start with Smokey Save for $5. Thank you. Smokey SFT. Can you finally concede that OSAS is inferior to if saved, always saved question mark. Salvation lost is ultimately exactly the same as never saved. No, because <clears throat> When people have an unsophisticated view of, of what it means to be saved, where they literally think some atheist who says they were 
a Christian, but when you actually question these atheists, and it, it's happened so many times in my personal experience where you say, okay, you were saved. So you say, what's the gospel to you? What does being saved mean? And all of a sudden they start saying things like, well, you know, I'll, I followed the Ten Commandments, read my Bible, went to church, parents dragged me to church. That's not salvation. Just like in Matthew 7, they were not doing the will of the Father, which when we interpret scripture with scripture, we know that the will of the Father is to believe on the Son. That means you can be somebody who even says Jesus is Lord, but yet you did not do the will. And therefore all those works, haven't we done many wonderful works? If I was standing in front of Christ, he said, why should I let you in? I'd say, because of you and because of what you have done. So no, once saved, always saved, understands that this is referring to someone who's truly been justified, regenerated, sanctified, predestined for, for glorification, not, oh, well, Matt Dillahunty said that he was saved. So let's not go talk to him about his root. Let's just assume that that's true. That's unsophisticated and an unsophisticated approach to soteriology. That is not, a head knowledge is not true regeneration. So no. Once saved, always saved, or uh, if saved, always saved, once a son, always son, they all apply because over and over again, we read in the Bible, eternal life. I give to them everlasting life. We've been passed from death unto life. No man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. We shall never thirst, never hunger. I mean, how else could Jesus have spelt it out? It's so clear, I yield. Appreciate your response, SFT. Gavin, you want to res do you want to quickly respond to that or we'll get to the next one if you don't want to? You're on mute. Oh, there Gavin, you go. Gavin, you're you're unmuted. You're good. Am I? Oh, okay. Um. Yeah. Look, my only response to that would be, um, Donnie, can I make an appeal to you to desist, desist from the passive-aggressive comments? You started, you started your answer to Smokey with, when people have an unsophisticated view of, view of Scripture... I stand by my statement. Well, it's not the kind of thing that I would say. Um, yeah, we'll get, important. yeah, we'll get to the next one. So, Jungle... Well, let me, well actually, praise, because there's my question. Okay. Give me the last word. Yeah. So I'm not necessarily saying that... Anybody who's confused on this doctrine has an unsophisticated view. But when you've spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours educating these people on the differences between someone who's truly saved and regenerated versus somebody who has a head knowledge like Matt Dillahunty, and they still don't get it and they still use those arguments, then yes, it then becomes not just confusion on a doctrine, but it becomes a willingly... A, a, a willful choice to hold to unsophisticated doctrine. So there you go. Very good. We'll go to Jungle Jargon for five dollars. Thank you, Jungle. Who is doing the saving, Gavin? God. Um, if you want to, is that do you, is that it, uh, Gavin? Is that your conclusion? Yeah. you're fine. Okay. So go yeah. ahead, SFT. Yeah, I think um, it's it's clear that it, that it's a work of God, and that's why God says He will lose none; He will raise up all His sheep on the last day. Okay, according to the conditionalist, He will lose some, even though it says He will lose none, or no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand because it is God that keeps us. It is God that gives us the new birth, the new man. The new man has no sin. Okay, people don't understand that when. I got saved or you got saved. It wasn't my flesh that got regenerated. No, God created a brand new creature, SFT 2.0. But guess what? I still have the old SFT. And the old SFT and SFT 2.0, they fight every single day. It's a daily war, a daily struggle. And one day the old SFT will die for good and the SFT 2.0 will go to heaven. And that's all because of God. It's all because of what he has done. And he will lose some. He will lose none. It was addressed to you, Gavin, so you have the last word on that. Yeah, my answer remains the same. Uh, jungle, my friend, it's God that does the saving. Thanks, God, for that. Very good. So we have Mary Titus for $3. She says, I'm poor, but have some Taco Bell on me. 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Shalom, for shalom, shalom to Mary Todd. We appreciate that, Mary. Thank you so much. Here's Caleb for ten dollars. He's coming at you, Gavin. <laughs> Just. <laughs> <laughs> Does Gavin claim God will remove the Holy Spirit from a Christian who has been sealed with it? If no, then does he claim someone indwelt with the Holy Spirit who lost salvation can go to hell? Oh, my goodness. Um, say that again quickly, Prize. Sure. Gavin, so does Gavin claim God will remove the Holy Spirit from a Christian who has been sealed with it? Question mark. If no, no, no my answer to that is no. Well, it's a it's a two part question. Here's the second part. If no, yep. then does he claim someone indwelt with the Holy Spirit who lost salvation can go to hell? Caleb, here's the problem: we are uh, mortal. Uh, human beings, we have free will. Free will is a two-lane highway. It's either a highway to heaven or it's a highway to hell. We make the choice to keep the covenant with God or not. God never gives up on his part of the covenant. That's your answer. Very like good. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so uh, we've been sealed under the day of redemption, so no, we can't lose the the holy spirit that's what the bible says we've also been given the new man made a new creature we can't lose that no man can pluck us out of the father's hand and this whole free will argument is just is just sad okay we have limited free will okay think about this <laughs> god is so okay wait a minute wait a minute gavin wants to say wow. that i'm being mean for pointing out wow. but gavin on, let him finish. laughs when, when, when every time that i refute him so here's the thing God is sovereign. He is all powerful and all knowing. So yes, we have free will, but not unlimited free will. Even God doesn't have e unlimited free will. God is eternal. Deuteronomy 33, 1 Timothy 1. He can't stop being eternal. That is who he is. God is true. That means he can't choose to lie. God cannot lie. God is just. Can he choose to be unjust? God cannot violate his own nature. He is restricted by who he is. Of course, it is a good thing that God cannot choose to do evil, and it will be a good thing when in eternity, future, we cannot choose to do evil either. Now, when it comes to us, do we have unlimited free will? If I wanted to put on a cape and put underwear over my pants and try and fly like Superman, can I do that? No, it's not possible. Okay, so there are some things with us that are unchangeable. Look at this, Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? The answer to each question is no. Can anyone decide to give back his ethnicity? No, he might renounce his citizenship and become a citizen of another country, but his ethnicity does not change. Can we change our height, personality, IQ? No, point is when God seals us, we still have, yes, the old man and we can, through our free will, walk according to the old man. But we don't have unlimited free will. And when God says he will keep us, he will lose none, and no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand, you better accept the fact that you can't jump off a building and fly if you wanted to, and God will keep you because that's what the Bible says. And you can walk away or you can willfully sin, but that doesn't change your genetics. You've been regenerated. I yield. Is that my question, Prize? Yes, go ahead and it's, it's you can finish it out. I can have the last say. Okay, so uh, uh, SFT, please keep believing in your Gnostic theology um, like um, unless you believe in young earth creationism, you will not see salvation. Keep believing that. Wait, wait, wait. Praise, we can't allow a slapping around. I was taking a drink of water. Did he just say that I believe if you're not a young earth creationist, you can't be saved? Or hey, can you repeat yeah, that last one? We, uh, we don't want to just get this uh, off track here. Can we just keep it on track, you guys? I don't know anybody so, who says that. Just just keep believing your Gnostic theology. All right, let's try to keep yeah, let's try to keep the You keep appealing to those church fathers who believe in purgatory and right. transubstantiation and All worship right, of marriage. Let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. <laughs> Jamie Russell for five dollars. He says God did it. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> amen. I can only say amen to that. I can only say amen to that. 
Thank so, you, Jamie, brother. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Here's another one from Jamie again. Back to back, five dollars. Lift up your heads. Your salvation draws near. Amen. Amen. And, and I'll say, and I'll say that's that's what it's all about. Glorification. Right now, our spirit is regenerated. It's sinless. It's perfect. But we still have this flesh, and that's what you see here. That's what we see with Gavin. It's this unregenerate flesh that is still capable of sinning, still capable of falling away from church, still capable of aches and pains. That's why we still have the aches and pains. But one day, one day, we may never even die. If we are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord, we will be changed from corruptible to incorruptible. We will be given new, glorified, regenerated bodies, perfect bodies that feel no pain that are perfect like our like our spirit. So people that don't understand that we still have the old man and the unregenerated flesh, this is why they fall into this conditionalism. And I yield. Count the last word. Um well, it wasn't address anyone, so you can just respond and we'll probably get to the next one. <laughs> I've forgotten what I was gonna say. Carry on. Next one. <laughs> okay. All right, that sounds good. We'll go to steadfast and easy for five dollars. Thank you for your super chat. The covenant is from God to us. We have no action in it except faith. Amen. Amen. And that's why the verse that I uh, pulled up earlier, beautiful verse, <clears throat> which got uh, Psalm 89, my covenant will I not break. Okay. And it's just amazing because even, even the things that King Solomon he fell away. He had 700 wives, 700 concubines. King David committed adultery, murder, fell away from God. And what did he say? He lost his salvation. No, he says he lost the joy of his salvation. He lost his fellowship. He never actually lost regeneration or justification because as Psalm 89 says, my covenant will I not break. According to Gavin's theology, the Christian Corinthians who were into prostitution, incest, the worst types of carnality. If they didn't lose their salvation, then I don't know what it takes. So go ahead, I yield. Go ahead, Gavin. If you can respond, we'll get to the no, next no, one. No, 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 no. Next one, next one, next one. K-Love for $10 coming at you, Gavin, again. <laughs> All right. Thank hey, you, love, brother. Hey, love. I love this guy. <laughs> Gavin has conceded that the Holy Spirit can't be removed after a Christian has been sealed. I'll now ask again. If someone is indwelt with the Holy Spirit, can they go to hell? Question mark. Absolutely. If they lose their faith, will they forfeit their faith? Which part of that do you not understand, Caleb? What's the question, praise? Um... I'll know, okay, if someone is indwelt with the Holy Spirit, can they go to hell? Oh, we answered that earlier, or he, he did another super chat? Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, a, re, a rejoinder to that. Right, and and um, <clears throat> my response would be the same, that we, we read in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. If we deny the faith and reject him, Christ still lives within us and cannot deny himself, but he will deny what? Our reign with him. That's why it's so detrimental that you understand the difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment, or you will do as Gavin has done throughout this debate. Look to passages that deal with eternal rewards or temporal chastisement and apply them to salvation. They don't belong over here. They belong over here. This is salvation. Salvation. Eternal rewards. Discipleship. Fellowship. Don't mix them in. That's what results in a work salvation. I yield. Go ahead, Gavin. You want to respond to that? No, no, no. Let's move to the next one. Okay, so now we're into the general questions now. Honest the angel, she's coming at you, Gavin. When a person is saved, they receive the Holy Spirit. Can you quote a New Testament verse or verses that says the Holy Spirit leaves someone? No, I can't. I cannot. I cannot. But I can um, point to plenty of verses where people have fallen from the faith or, uh, what's the word, praise? Um, <laughs> yeah. Give the gift yeah. back, yeah. even though the yeah. gifts are your Forfeit. Forfeit of their faith. Yeah, forfeit of their faith. <laughs> My turn, praise? Yeah, go ahead. 
So it's, you know, it's like dealing with the evolutionists, right? Chromosome two fusion, pseudo genes, nested hierarchies, ERVs, ALU sequences, same talking points over and over again. No matter how many times you've demolished them, they still keep bringing them up. We can forfeit it. We can give the gift back. We can pluck ourselves out of the father's hands. Just ignoring the fact that those arguments have been debunked over the last two hours. And it's just so funny because I pointed out in my rebuttal that Jesus says, he who comes to me will never hunger, never thirst. We've been sealed under the day of your redemption. Are you saying that we can do the unsealing? No, that is a stamp of approval from God himself. God does not commit spiritual abortion. The moment we come to him, we get everlasting life. We are born again. Was being born the first time? Okay, praise I am was born on this day at this time. When you're born again, regenerated in the spirit, you're born on this day at this time. You can't reverse that in the same way that you can't reverse the physical birth. When you're born and you have the genetics of mom and dad, that's permanent. Even if you walked away from mom and dad, that ain't going to change the genetics. Even if you hypothetically mm -hmm. walked away from God, that ain't going to change the genetics you were given at regeneration, I yield. Okay, was it addressed to me, Prose? Yeah, so you could finish out. Yeah, um, uh, Donnie, you shouldn't have stepped on that landmine. You're committing a category error here. You're comparing human fleshly abortion with what you call spiritual abortion, which is not a phrase that appears in the Bible anywhere. Okay? So the fact is that the facts are that we have free will. There's no doubt about that. But that's a whole other a, a, a whole other debate on its own. I'm happy to debate that if you want. Um, and we enter into a covenant with God. God will not break His covenant. He's not a covenant breaker. How, however, we are mere mortals. We are seriously flawed human beings. Man breaks covenants with God often, and there's a ton of scripture that supports that. So it is possible for a believer to forfeit their salvation. There's plenty of examples of that in Scripture. Um, so that's it, you know. You use these buzzwords like spiritual abortion. Um, the, the, these are not words that appear in the Bible. These are, not, these are buzzwords that are created by the free grace and, and ET um, movement. And like I said, there's nothing new about the free grace and ET movement. Um, you're just wearing a different suit in the 21st century. Very good. Thank you for your uh, comment. Now we're going to go to Montaz. Question for you, Gavin. How come the man in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5 is saved? Can you read the verse for me, Praise? Because I, I, I haven't got that. Can you read the verse um, for me, please? Yeah, hold on. Shalom, Montez. Shalom, brother. Um, He said 5, 1. Let me see really quick. This is about the one who's been given over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I'm trying to move my way back up. Yeah, five, one through five. Let me see that. Um, so it is actually reported there's sexual immorality among you and a kind of the pagans do not tolerate a man sleep. Yeah, so it's yeah, that one. The incest. Yeah. So what is the verse that Montez is referring to? He's Montez. asking you why is that guy saved given what he did? Oh, look, I'd have to, I'd have to read I'd have to read the the whole context of of it. So is is he sa is he is he is is the Bible saying is the scripture saying that he's saved even though he he's committed incest? Well, I mean that's what the debate's about. Is he, is he saved? Is it saying he can be saved, or is it saying that he's fallen away from his faith? Um, I mean, I could read these out quickly if you want me to, but we got to. Yeah, if you oh, could. Okay. 
if you could, please. It, it is actually actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man sleeping with his father's wife, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put off out of your fellowship of the man who has been doing this? For my gotcha. part, even though yeah. I am not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. Okay, yeah, yeah. basically. There yeah, you. I've got you. I've got you. Okay, so um, there's. There is, there is, uh, we, we cannot, if we're saved, right? If we have faith in Christ, this is, this is really simple and well known. If we have faith in Christ, we maintain that faith in Christ. Um, we cannot sin our way out of salvation. There's no such thing as sinning our way out of salvation. Um, it's, it's a heart thing. Now, whether that person is still saved or still regenerated is not for me to say. That's between them and God. But, no, I don't believe you can sin your way out of salvation. <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll respond. So I want to point out the utter inconsistency of, of these people who hold to this garbage theology, okay, because they'll look to verses because they Google, oh, you know, how, how to refute once saved, always saved. So what comes up is verses like Hebrews 10 that talks about if we sin willfully, They'll say that means we can lose our salvation. They'll look to verses in Hebrews 6 that says, well, if we fall away, then we lose our salvation. They'll look to verses in uh, like the parable of the sower. They'll look to John 15 and say, well, if you're not fruitful enough, you'll fall away. But then when they're cornered, they'll say, well, you know, if you sin, yeah, you won't lose your salvation. It's just, you see, but they're going to verses that talk about if you sin willfully and they're trying to apply it to their salvation, or they'll look to that verse that makes me laugh where it says, if we don't forgive our brother's trespasses, then God won't, won't forgive our trespasses. When clearly I showed a verse that talks about God forgiving all our trespasses from a positional sense, but they're saying, well, only if we forfeit. Well, that's not saying if we forfeit. Now they're saying that if we don't forgive our brothers here on earth, then we lose. Well, what is it? Is it just forfeit or is it also sin? Is it also being unfruitful? Their theology is inconsistent right here. This was a great question. Absolutely destroys this position. The Apostle Paul mentions one man in particular in the church who has taken fornication to the next level by having immoral relations with his stepmother. So this is a backslidden man. What does it say? To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The scripture also provides incontrovertible proof that these conditionalists or lordship, salvation, whatever you want to look to, is false. Because guess what? This man who, who was so sinful and the apostle Paul asked the church to boot him out as praise just read, okay? Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. This man was saved. He was carnal. But he was a fornicator, shameless right, wrap living, it up, wrap it up, in the house of God. Yet Paul yeah. said Enough that, preaching, man, enough man, enough I'm preaching, this man's spirit, that this man's spirit, this man spirit would be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So we have was a man who's incredibly make, backslidden, Christ, was incredibly was incredibly backslidden and he's given over to chastisement because he himself to be saved. Was that a question to me? Okay, that was a question to me. Donnie, can I ask you not to um, like preach when you're answering a question? So the question was something about some guy committing incest, and my answer was no. I do not believe we can sin our way out of salvation. That's it. Move on. All right, please. we're moving on to the next moving orn. <laughs> Nicholas, no, hey, praise. We're going on two and a half hours. So start winding this up because I'm just tired of. It's pretty much just an education session for, for Gavin. We're going two and a half hours. Pick one last question. We got to call this tonight. It's getting. Yeah, getting I'm, have, I'm just going to have to go in chronological order. So here's the last one Nicholas Proclaimer Messiah. Nicholas, question, shalom. Question for Bo Do you, do you think you are capable of maintaining the salvation and justification which were bought with Christ's precious blood? Should no, I go first? No. Should I go first? I'll, I'll be quick. If if salvation were up to me, I'd fail because none of us forgive our brothers perfectly. None of us love perfectly. None of us abide in Christ perfectly. So no, it's all on. It's not on my ability to abide in fellowship because there are people who may die while not abiding in fellowship with Christ. So it's all about Christ. The reason why I'm justified regenerated, sanctified, predestined for glorification is because of him. If it were up to me, 
it wouldn't be possible because we, we fail every day. Go ahead, Gav. Can you shoot that bomb me again, Price? Price? Yeah. Do you think you are capable of maintaining the salvation and justification which were bought with Christ's precious blood? Not at all. Not in my own flesh. Thanks, God, for the Holy Spirit. Since since we only have five, it's five minutes to two and a half hours, how we go for five more minutes? Because I know CJ wants his question to be uh, sure. asked. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. All right. So here's CJ. A uh, question for both. Um, why does it seem all the anti-OSASers conflate OSAS with free grace, even though literally all lordship believers are OSAS? I'll start. Yeah, so as I pointed out in my opening um, and my rebuttal, Gavin's burden of proof was to demonstrate conditional security. He went on attacking only the free grace side, which I think I defended well and refuted all his arguments, actually. But that doesn't help his burden of proof because, as CJ pointed out, there are those in the reformed camp who also hold the eternal security. Now there's there's a few differences, okay, in terms of they, they more so hold the preservation because a lot of them are Calvinists. And they say that the perseverance, I should say, perseverance of the saints, right, Tulip? total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. They say the perseverance is a gift. We persevere and endure because of God's gift. God regenerates us, then we have faith. The free gracers are not Calvinist. Now, we, we don't believe in unlimited free will, but we recognize the fact that it's better to be understood as preservation because we still have the free will to walk in the flesh in the old man perseverance and absolute endurance might not be a guarantee because we have that free will. So that's the difference is, but still both maintain eternal security. So Gavin has to refute eternal security and picking on one or the other isn't going to help his burden to prove. Uh, go ahead. Good, very good question. Uh, Gavin okay. was addressed. Yes. Both of you guys. So if you want to, can, can you repeat it, please? Can you repeat it, please? Sure. Let's see here. Why does it seem all the anti osasers conflate OSAS with free grace, even though literally all lordship believers are OSAS? Uh, there's not much difference between OSAS and free grace in my mind, but um, I had to chuckle because I was waiting for, for Donnie to step on that landmine. You've just committed dance law, Donnie, by talking about how well you've defended eternal security. Well done. That's called dance law, breaking dance law, committing dance law. So we'll go to the next one by Redefine Living. If I Shalom look at Sam. A, Shalom Sam. If I look at a seductive woman while driving home and immediately die in the crash, am I going to hell for committing adultery in my heart at that moment? Depends if your faith is in Christ or not, Sam. You know the answer to that. Um, SAT, if you want to respond to that too, you can. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. If I look at a seductive, okay. If I look at a seductive woman while driving home and immediately die in a crash, am I going to hell for committing adultery in my heart at that moment? Right. Right. So of course, of course, when we're, when we're saved, we're regenerated, we're given the new birth that can't be reversed. We've been passed from death into life. Gavin has provided zero evidence from from scripture that 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 can be undone or that there can be an unsealing so if a person dies in unconfessed sin or they die out of fellowship because once again a major talking point is well to be saved is you gotta abide in christ well i've already pointed out that abiding in christ has to do with fellowship has to do with our spiritual education so there are times when all of us are not abiding in Christ. Anytime that we're walking in the flesh or the old man, we're not abiding in Christ. So if we died in unconfessed sin, we would die while not abiding in Christ, but we're still saved. Now we might lose rewards in heaven, uh, but as the Bible says, if we deny him, he remains He remains faithful. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Was that there a are question things we can lose. Was that there a are question things we can lose, but not salvation. No, but it's, oh. it, you're welcome to address it though. Okay. Oh no, I'll just I'll just say, Donnie, I really am making a plea to you to stop these passive aggressive digs, okay? Be a bit more professional. Gavin, 
Gavin, you had weeks to prepare for this. And unfortunately, you've demonstrated the strength of eternal security. And I want to thank you for that. I really appreciate that, Gavin. All right. Since we have just one more question by Crimson Air, I think we just fit it in. And if you guys Crimson just, Air. just Crimson squeeze Air it in the there. Man. I know you He's guys have been He's at it. And it's been passion. That's been good. But SFT <laughs> coming at you. What's the interpretation of Revelation 22? Do you prefer between the Book of Life and the Tree of Life for verse 19? I think I caught most of that. You were cutting in and out a lot there. Okay. It might have been from Gavin's Ed, so I muted. So essentially, how do I explain I'll the Book of Life? I'll, I'll just repeat yeah, it. Okay. Yeah. So SFT, which interpretation of Revelation 22 do you prefer between the Book of Life and the Tree of Life for verse 19? Oh, um... Good question. I, I, I have no problem with it being the book of life because I don't see any contradiction with the book of life. Because if you actually do a word study and look up the, the book of life in the Bible, you're never, and I challenge you, you're never going to find a time where a person's name, and uh, maybe Gavin can can have a chance here while, while I explain this, but I've never seen a, a, a moment where someone's name is being added to the book of life. Okay, so we see people's names being added before the foundation of the world, but never during one's lifetime. So to me, I think it's pretty clear that everybody is born in the book of life. Okay, and um, if somebody is given over, let's say, to a reprobate mind in their lifetime, there's the unforgivable sin. There's the scenario in Hebrews 6. We have Romans 1. They will be removed early because the Bible says they are twice dead, plucked up from the root. They are walking zombies, okay? They've essentially just died here on this earth. So they're removed early. If someone dies in their sins without salvation, they are removed because now they die in unregeneration. But somebody who is saved, the Bible says, Jesus says, to him that overcometh, I will not blot out. And to overcometh is, is to believe. So I, I have no problem with, with the book of life. And uh, I, I think it's it's very consistent throughout scripture that the regenerated are never removed. Only, only someone who is taken from unregeneration to reprobation and somebody who dies in a state of unregeneration. So, Well, it, it, once Gavin can respond to that, we're going to probably shut her down here and give it to SFT and uh, we'll head to the after shows. Or if Gavin doesn't want to. Well, I think Gavin's on mute. <laughs> Gavin, you're on mute. I apologize. Go ahead. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. If you want to just give your concluding remark and then we'll uh, shut can, her down, give it to pass it yeah, off to SFT. Can you run that last question from Crimson Air by me again, please? Um, Some about a tree. I actually <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Some of the tree of life or something. Yeah, maybe. I don't even think you. Yeah. No, that's okay. That's fine. It was at SFT yeah. anyway. So. Okay. Okay. That's fine. All right. It's all yours, SFT. If you want to shut her down. Great stuff, guys. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoy this. This was the big debate that we've had uh, scheduled for a couple weeks. Uh, both Gavin and I uh, are passionate because we prepared a lot for this. And, and to anybody who. Is, is just joining this debate and doesn't know the history of it. it. It got a little passionate on both sides because this has been an ongoing debate. This has been an ongoing controversy for the last probably six months. So that's why we came in this prepared. We had two weeks and, um, you know, this, this was to showcase both sides. And I'm really happy with how this turned out because it really showcases the strength and just how irrefutable eternal security is and just how indefensible conditional security is. So that being said, Gavin's not here anymore, but I just wanted it to give everyone the heads up if you're thinking, well, that got a little heated at times. Yeah, because it's been an ongoing controversy for a while in this community. And this was kind of the, this was the debate, you know, where we debate for two and a half to three hours and we both present our sides and it, it was destined to be a little passionate. So that being said, I hope everybody had a good time. We've had a great audience. God bless everybody. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't want to say anything to that because Gavin's not here anymore. So I'll say this. I'm very, very happy with how this debate turned out. So that being said, God bless everybody. And SFT 